everybody. Good morning. I'd like, I'd like to call this uh, full outline. Did we lose Doc? I believe we did. We'll wait a moment for him to come back. Hello, you guys got me? Good morning, Doc. We hear you. Okay. Can you flip your camera around? Uh, how do I do that again? Let's see here. Uh, I think I lost that, but I did. How did I do that, Chris? Do you remember? I don't. There we go. Don't Okay, good morning. On this cold January morning, I, I talking to board members, it looks like Eagle River does not have the state low as far as this board goes at 22 below, but I think Bill Smith, you said 24 below in Shell Lake. Is that correct? I did with a wind, but I think Marcy's uh, even colder than that. What are you at, Marcy? At 5 a.m., we were at negative 26. Oh, then you get the star. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. I call our January 26th virtual meeting 2022 in order. Please join me in saying a pledge to this great nation. Glory, but there you are. I pledge allegiance to the flag. The flag. The flag. United United States States America. Of America. And to the Republic. The Republic for which is one nation, one nation. Under God. Under God. Justice for all. Thank you. On behalf of the National Resource Board, I welcome each of you today. Please know there's sometimes a delay in broadcasts. This is not our first rodeo after the last two years with this pandemic. If it's easy to talk over each other when we are virtual, make sure your computer tab is up and running and you're able to turn your mic off when you're not talking. I also ask that motions be made slower for Lori to understand them. Lori, please interrupt us immediately if you're not clear what is being said or who made the motion. Staff presenters, be ready to go on Zoom. Stay muted and your video off until you announce your time. Uh, our meetings are televised by live TV, YouTube TV, and we especially want to welcome and thank you all the viewers for chiming in. Public testimony is welcome in each and every regular scheduled meeting. This is the benchmark for how this board's operated for 51 years now. This meeting will have 14 appearances on Zoom. Special thanks for short-term notice because of the in uh, pandemic and the Omicron variant, which is rapidly running through our cities, even with the triple jab and the masking, it's still something that's just invading every aspect we can put at it. But Christopher Tall for Zoom, thank you for doing this in short notice. Fred Alderman for live webcasts, Jeff, Chris, Ben, Scott for ensuring all board matters. Information is available online for the public, Sarah, Katie, and Jonah for media releases. Kari, Lee Zimmerman, our Wisconsin Conservation Congress liaison, who helped us work on the longstanding partners dealing with the national resources. Thank you. And as usual, Lawyer Ross has put an extra amount of time this month to make this happen. She's the link between historical, ourselves, and the department. Thank you for your guidance, Lori. Law enforcement, Nick Mofiski, Chief Casey Krieger, and his warden team, what goes without saying, as I've said every month for three years now, your ability to protect our resources protect the department and protect the staff and put yourself in the line of duty uh, speaks for itself. Secretary Preston Cole, Deputy Secretary Sarah Berry, Assistant Deputy Secretary Stephen Little, Legal Counsel Cheryl Hellman, and department staff, thank you for participating today and making your presentations. Your time is valuable. Lastly, the 2,200 permanent employees and 1,400 limited employees of the Department of Natural Resources for continued commitment to tireless effort to the National Resources and all these citizens. Board member, are there any questions or comments? 
Uh, Lori, you please take roll. Good morning. William Bruins. Here. Sharon Adams. Here. Terry Hilgenberg. Here. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Greg Kazmierski. Here. Marcy West. Here. William Smith. Here. Dr. Prane. Here. Full tennis. Mr. Secretary, any changes to the agenda? Mr. Chair, we have no changes to today's agenda. Then I would take a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So move, Kaz. Kaz, second. Second, second, second Terry. Terry. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion, change, motion passes. At this time, I'd like to welcome our new D DNR Deputy Secretary Sarah Berry to the board meeting. Sarah, please turn your video on or Preston, do you want to make introductions and let's let's hear from our new deputy secretary. Sarah? I'll let Sarah uh, take it from here. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Secretary Cole. Uh, thank you, Chair Pran, for the introduction. For a little background, I have served several state senators over the last 15 years working on environmental policy. Additionally, I have served two nonprofit organizations in the environmental field as well. And I am truly honored to have been appointed by Secretary Cole to serve in this important role. I am dedicated to the mission of the department to serve as stewards of Wisconsin's important and valuable natural resources. I am also dedicated to working with the Natural Resources Board to the very best of my ability. Thank you so much for this opportunity to introduce myself. Okay, Sarah, thank you. Welcome to the family. It's, uh, it's very, I, I think when you talk to your predecessor, Todd Ames, it's, uh, it's, it's, most, it's most fulfilling, but also frustrating position we're all in, but we have one common cause and that's to the, to the better good of our resources. So welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, next item, you guys, is consent agenda. We have approval of brief of action from December 8th, 2021. Request for approval of prohibition of one nature-based outdoor activity, hunting, to protect the public safety on land to be purchased by Knowles, Nelson Stewardship Funds, Groundswell Conservatory, Dane County. We have request for approval for the prohibition of one nature-based activity, hunting again, to protect the public safety on land purchased by the Knowles, Nelson Stewardship Funds in the city of Schofield, Marathon County. And you have one request of approval of prohibition of two nature-based activities, two, hunting and trapping to protect the public safety on land to be purchased by Knowles and Nelson Stewart Funds, San Dimano, Friary Acquisition, City of Monona, Dane County. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. For a second. Second. Would anybody, would anybody like any of those pulled off for further independent debate? Hearing none, I need a motion. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion, motion carries. Hold on a second. Was there public testimony in that? I don't believe there was. No, no not. there is not, Dr. Payne. Okay. All right. Next item. Action items. Here we go. 4A, request adoption of board order WA1718, proposed rules affecting chapters NR500 to 520 related to coal combustion residual landfills. Katie Horns, Recycling and Solid Waste Section Chief. Katie, welcome. Well, good morning, members of the board and Secretary Cole. I'm Kate Strum Hirons, the Recycling and Solid Waste Section Chief in our Waste and Materials Management Program. And also on Zoom is Valerie Justin, our lead engineer and plan review expert who works out of our Green Bay office. And she was one of our main authors of the rule, along with Philip Fobble and Joe Lorgan. Next slide. So this morning I'm requesting your approval to adopt WA17-18 related to coal combustion residual landfills. Next slide. Wisconsin currently regulates coal combustion residual waste under our landfill siting, operation, and closure rules. Disposal of CCR or coal ash should be properly managed to prevent contaminants such as mercury and arsenic from entering soil, air, or water resources. We wrote this rule because of new federal laws that govern CCR disposal sites nationwide, which resulted in CCR landfills in Wisconsin being regulated by both DNR and the Environmental Protection Agency. Where those rules differ, the landfills must meet both federal and state laws. So our goal is to make state landfill disposal rules consistent with and as protective as federal rules and remove that dual regulation. Next slide. 
The CCR landfills in Wisconsin that accepted coal ash after October 2015 already have liner systems. They have constructed the groundwater monitoring wells and have done record keeping required under those federal regulations. By adding to our existing state rules that have overseen these landfills for many years, the DNR can request EPA approval of a Wisconsin CCR permit program. And this would allow the four electric utility companies that op operate six landfill locations to apply a single set of consolidated rules and interact with one regulatory agency. So this rule would include requirements for CCR landfill design and operating criteria, closure and post-closure care, review fees and record keeping and posting of information. In response to comments from individuals and a group of conservation and environmental health organizations, we ensure that the, the rule also includes robust public participation opportunities at multiple stages of landfill plan review. Next slide. There were also multiple public participation opportunities during the rulemaking. In addition to the public hearings and economic impact comment period dates noted on the slide, we had frequent calls with representatives of the Wisconsin Utilities Association and Dairyland Power Cooperative, which includes all the companies that operate these CCR landfills. And we had monthly recurring calls with the EPA and incorporated comments and talked with representatives of the conservation and environmental health organizations. Comments we received were in support of the rule or to request additional regulations. And we did add clarifications and sections to the rule and direct response to those comments. One area that we will consider for potential future rulemaking, so not in this rule, is also incorporating federal rules to regulate closed CCR surface impoundments, which holds coal ash and liquids and are used to treat, store, or dispose that CCR coal ash. The DNR made a decision early on as presented to stakeholders in December 2020 to focus its efforts on CCR landfills only because some federal surface impoundment regulations are still undergoing review or modification and a small number of Wisconsin surface impoundments are closing over the next couple of years. Next slide. In closing, I ask for your approval of WA 17-18, so Wisconsin code is as protective as nationwide rules for CCR landfills, and to allow those facility owners to work with one regulatory agency. Valerie and I would be happy to answer any questions, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Kate. You want to just hang on for a second? We do have one public appearance. I'd like to get on the testimony, and then we'll come back to questions for Kate and Valerie. Bill Skews from Madison, representing you, Wisconsin Utilities Association, and Jeff Max. I guess they're together, according to my sheet, from Madison, representing Alliant Energy. Bill? Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the proposed rules for coal combustion residuals this morning, or CCR. My name is Bill Skews. I'm the executive director of the Wisconsin Utilities Association, which is a 501c6 nonprofit that represents the investor-owned gas and electric utilities before the Wisconsin legislature and regulatory bodies. Here to make a brief statement in support of the, of the draft rule. Joining me in case there are questions of a technical nature is Jeff Maxted from Alliant Energy, who chairs the uh, working group that put together our comments on this issue. So on behalf of WUA and Dairyland, uh, here in support of the proposed rules affecting chapters NR500 and 520 related to CCR landfills. We support Wisconsin DNR's approach, which relies on a framework that is currently used in Wisconsin to regulate landfills. This framework has been successfully used by the department to regulate landfills for decades. And we agree that this is an appropriate way to unite the state and federal requirements. Relying on a familiar state framework also provides compliance certainty and consistency that's important to the regula regulated community. WUA and Dairyland appreciate the department's work to develop rules that provide for the safe management of CCR and support beneficial reuse of these resources. Wisconsin DNR staff have engaged interested parties throughout the process and have developed rules that reflect feedback that we've provided. The proposed rules are the result of many productive conversations and a common goal to protect human health and the environment. So for these reasons, we support adoption of these rules. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide comments. Any questions for William or for Jeff? Thank you for your testimony. Okay, board members, back to Kate. Uh, any questions for Kate regarding these rules? 
Um, uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Um, I I was just wondering, you know, if the same rules apply to these as to landfills, are there test wells uh, uh, by each of these uh, sites, uh, and and how are they monitored, or how does that work? Yes, there actually are a couple different sets of groundwater monitoring wells, um, probably additional wells at these CCR landfills than there are at our other landfills because um, we have certain, they like I mentioned earlier, these sites have been regulated by state law. So they've fallen under our uh, groundwater and other monitoring requirements. Um, and then when the new federal law came into place, they were required to put in some um, new wells, new groundwater monitoring wells that are testing different levels of uh, the where the water is at the water table. And so, yep, these have similar monitoring um, and also additional monitoring than other landfills. Okay, so follow-up question, if I may. Sure. Here we go. So, so if per chance you should find that one of these liners and one of these sites is leaking, do you have a plan in place as to how to mitigate at that point? Yes, uh, that like it, and we have had those rules in place for that there are requirements uh, for uh, additional monitoring and additional cleanup. And that is something that is very uh, strong in the federal rule that we have certain uh, day limits in place of when each site is supposed to come up with an assessment monitoring plan come up with a plan for remedial activities and then work with the department to get that in place. So that's, that's a big part of what this rule is, what we're trying to do. Is there, is there any limit to the amount of coal ash that can be uh, uh, assimilated in one spot? Um, I'm not sure I understand your question, but I, it depends on just the size of the landfill cell and of what they've built that can contain um, this certain amount of ash that's planned right from the start. They have to come in with a plan of operation and uh, kind of that assessment of how much each site can contain. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any other questions for Kate? Marcy. Not a question, just a, a thank you for the briefing and uh, for the utilities and uh, organizations that participated. It was very helpful. Um, if there's no other questions, I'd motion that we adopt the rule. Is there a second? I second. Sharon, second. Any debate? Terry. Yeah, uh, thanks, Doc. I just wanted to compliment Kate and her team and the department on the outreach they did with working with the utilities. It's great to see that level of cooperation. Obviously, this is extremely important. Another one of those areas of, of uh extreme importance for our environment and water quality. And uh, hats off to you guys for doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Next one. Thank you. Yvette, thanks Kate and your team. Next one. It's gonna be a big one. <laughs> a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, a lot of written testimony. We received 58 written comments on this so the public knows. Request adoption board order FH0220, proposed rules affecting chapter in NR25 related to Lake Michigan whitefish management and Great Lakes commercial harvest reporting. Brad, Ego, please, Great Lakes District Fisheries Supervisor. Thank you, Chairman Crane, <laughs> Natural Resources Board members, Secretary Cole, for the opportunity to talk about FH0220, which governs Lake Whitefish commercial reporting rules. I'm Brad Eggle, Great Lakes District Fisheries Supervisor. Next slide, please. So where are we in this rule? Uh, we started this process all the way back, uh, actually before August of 2020, but we're seeking adoption of this final rule here today, FH0220. Next slide. So how have we gotten to this point? We had a ton of public engagement opportunities since August of 2020, uh, various public meetings, we formulated a sport group so they were aware of all these meetings and opportunities to weigh in on this uh, whitefish population and rules. We had a very a variety of preliminary and regular hearings, as well as attended a lot of commercial fishing board meetings, obviously a lot of calls and emails, and tried to get the word out through press releases, 
God delivery notices and emails, but each and every one of these opportunities for the public and stakeholders to weigh in on this very important topic in Green Bay and Lake Michigan. Next slide. At our last public hearing on January 4th, we had uh, 53 attendees at that public hearing and 19 comments. In addition to those, we had a lot of other written comments, as you can see, fairly split 50-50, both in support and against the rule as written. The sport anglers uh, had a lot of opposition to the rule based on concerns about bycatch, as well as latent mortality of fish that are caught in nets and returned to the water. And we also had commercial fishers who opposed the development of this new restricted area in the southern part of the bay. And lastly, we did have some commenters who were uh, in favor of the 800,000 pound quota in zone one, while others were opposed to this increase past the level established in the current emergency rule. So based on these public comments and a lot of discussion ensued, two main changes were made to the permanent rule that were presented on January 4th. The first rule change was <clears throat> that the quota in zone one would be limited to the current emergency rule quota of 569,788 pounds. And that held through for the original as well as the amended rule sent to the Natural Resources Board. However, in the amended version, we clarified that this poundage would stay put for the 2022 20, and 23 fishing season and also follow that exact same level of emergency rule quote at 569,000 pounds. And secondarily, we did remove the restricted area and replaced with specific provisions in code for trap net use in the southern part of the bay. Next slide. So as far as the zone one quota, as I mentioned in the amended rule, we made it so that that rule was, that emergency quota was set for the 22 and 23 license years. This was done via uh, listening to the public comments, hearing where they were on this various rule. Next click, please, or two. Uh, in addition, this does provide some additional protection for sports fishery in zone one, because obviously we now have less quota in zone one from 800,000 pounds down to the 569 level. It will allow us to gather additional, have time to gather additional data and needs on latent mortality, as well as, well as other information needed over the next two years. The amended version does allow for a change in the zone one quota for commercial fishers beyond 2023. But of course, any changes would look needed additional data, stakeholder involvement, modeling the results, and then present that to the Natural Resources Board for changes to the tax or quotas that would go up, down, or actually stay the same. And we believe this final rule strikes a good balance between the science and the social political dynamics of this uh, complex lake whitefish fishery in Green Bay and Lake Michigan. Secondly, we did replace the restricted area with specific code provisions, uh, again, responding to public comments. However, the new provisions in code do meet the goal, and that is to collect bycatch information in these grids while still allowing some fishing in the southern part of the bay. So for grids 901, 902 and 1001, prior to uh, this change, you needed a, a permit to fish in restricted area. Well, now with code provisions, there are three provisions in code that allows you to fish in this area. Number one is would limit the number of trap nets to one per license. This still gives them the flexibility to fish in the southern part of the bay where and when they want to. And our large uh, businesses that own the majority of the whitefish quota in zone one have multiple licenses to fish in this area. And each license would be available and have one net for it. It would require fishers to notify the department 4 p.m. before each day, so that if we had staff that could ride and collect bycatch data, it'd be available to ride on these boats. And of course, even when monitors are not on board, would require the commercial fisher to report bycatch information. Next slide. So, our permanent rule provisions for this rule. Throughout this whole endeavor, we've had the total allowable catch set at Green Bay throughout at 1.176 million and Lake Michigan at slightly over 800,000 pounds. Then utilizing the formulas and code, established the zone quotas at zone one at 569,000 pounds, zone two at 1.56 million, 
and zone three slightly over 351,000. The real hallmark of this rule is that we have this, this total allowable catch firmly in the code, which will allow us to more quickly and nimbly respond to changes in the whitefish population moving forward and present before the Natural Resources Board changes uh, on a, at least a three-year time step. Number four there is something that we've been trying to do for the last 20 years, and that is to require fishes to report through our electronic fish harvest reporting system. So we're super excited to have that in this rule. Next slide. It does uh, provide us to capture trap net locations in Lake Michigan and Green Bay, as well as a trap name, net naming convention so we know what trap nets are being lifted on any given day. It maintains our sport commercial allocation in the bay at 50-50 and in the lake 0-100 between sport and commercial. And lastly, as I spoke, it does create provisions in code to limit one trap net per license. It has notifications so that we can capture onboard bycatch data and requires commercial fishers to report their bycatch when monitors are not on board. So what are the next steps then on this rule? We hope with that approval today, uh, next slide please, that the, if approved today, we hope that would go into effect somewhere in July of 2022. And because the way the rule is written would allow us to collect additional data in 22 and 23, and then run a new model run in, in the summer of 2023. Then we would engage stakeholder opportunities in summer and fall of 2023 and bring any presentation of changes to the TAC and quotas back to the Natural Resources Board in the fall of 2023 to, for the 2024 commercial season. With that, thank you for your time and I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, Todd, uh, Brad, thank you. Let's, uh, let's yep. go to the testimony first and then we'll come back to there from Charlie and then we'll come back for questions for, for Brad. First public appearance. Um, first of all, I'm going to make a statement that each speaker will be given three minutes to give their testimony. Please keep in mind the testimony that threatens, intimidates, or makes disparaging comments about board members, department staff, or other members of the public is unacceptable and will not be tolerated. This board welcomes citizen input, citizen input, input on all matters in natural resources management. Comments concerning any individual's personal information or personal business is not tolerated and not appropriate and will not be allowed. First one is Todd Smith. Bailey's Harbor, representing Hickory Brothers Research, LLC, and Bailey's Harbor Fish Company, LLC. We did receive a handout. Todd, are you online? Yes, I am. Welcome, Todd. You have three minutes. Good morning, Chair, and good morning to the Natural Resources Board. Um, I guess, basically, I know the time is limited, but I'd just like to say a few things in regards to this rule. For the greater majority of it, the package as it relates to the commercial fishing zones, the quota realignment, the mandated use of the EPR system and the provisions providing detailed net location information, we are 100% on board. Um, the one component part that I find troubling is, um, and I believe the commercial fishery finds it troubling, is the insertion of the res restrictive regulations proposed in this rule package for zone ones and zone one in Southern Green Bay, 901, 902, and 1001. Um, in order to advance the quota realignment, and this package, the Commercial Fishery commissioned and funded a study with the University of Wisconsin Green Bay to answer a lot of these questions um, on bycatch and increases in commercial fishing effort. We completed this study with due process to get us to this point. Nowhere in any of this study design details or meetings thereof were further restrictions on live entrapment gear um, or fishing areas brought to light or even debated. We had meetings in March, May, June, July, August, and December with DNR staff, Cheryl Heilman, Mark Herman, Brad Hagel, Todd Kalish, regarding the bullet points and key components of this rule package and restrictive regulations were never part of this discussion. I'm truly disappointed that this portion of added restrictions was added to the current rule package with zero due process. The way this is framed is counterintuitive and basically a double standard if this is an attempt to carry on a study that is truly in it in this way, it is truly a biased set of study parameters with added restrictions and the seasonality of the fishing in these fishery in these grids. Any collection of data with, substan with substantial gear constraints will yield inaccurate and skewed results. The fishery in these zones for Lake Whitefish, as far as trap netting is concerned, 
would really only occur from April to mid-June. So that period would be the re really the only time when data from trap nets could be collected in the first place. Beyond that period, 25 years of professional commercial fishing experience and the historical catch reports that the department has will vindicate whitefish leave these areas starting around June 1, and they do not migrate back into these areas until mid-September. I would like to close by saying that the inclusion of these res restrictive measures being added to the rule package in the last seconds of the game is truly based on speculation and projections and not on science. So in hopes of understanding where we're going with this, I really just wanted to bullet the bullet points that we had when we had discussed all of this rule package in its total alignment was, like I had previously stated, the realignment of zone quota, the allocation of a concrete zone three commercial quota, the increase of zone one, the EPRS mandate, so that all fishers would use the EPRS system, the electronic fish harvest reporting system, and provide detailed location information as far as the trap nets. 100% um, were on board with all of that. I just wanted to express my opposition to the restrictions placed in Southern Green Bay in 901, 902, and 1001. Thank you, Todd. Any questions for Todd? Stu, I think that's my said Smith. Stu, any questions for Todd? None. Thank you, Todd. Next one is William Hendrickson, Sister Bay, representing himself. William, Will, how are you? Good, yourself? Good. You have three minutes, Will. Um, thank you, Secretary Cole, Chairman Frayne, and members of the board for allowing me to speak today. My name is William Hendrickson from Sister Bay, and I am a second generation commercial fisherman. I'm speaking in favor of FH0220 with the revisions made in the made following the January 4th public meeting. I support the proposed 569,788 pound quota for 2022 and 2023 with the probability of that number reaching 800,000 pounds in zone one for 2024. I also know that there's concern that the biomass won't sustain this change, but I've personally observed the population grow and have been a part of multiple studies that have been conducted over the past seven years with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and the United States Fish and Wildlife Service confirming the increasing population of whitefish. With the proposed rule, it is giving the, the Wisconsin DNR, a chance to get second year data with the increased quota before running the population model again, showing that the population of whitefish in zone one of Green Bay can be safely harvested at a fair level. Recently, there has been angst stated about the latent mortality and barrow trauma caused from whitefish being in our nets. Even though we discussed this at the at great length as the study formed i recently reached out to top biologists at university of wisconsin stevens point in a recent and in a recent study to calculate lamprey mortality whitefish were collected from both sport and commercial fishers and transferred to holding facilities in the report it states that survival of fish caught hook and line fishing through the ice was poor but fish caught in trap nets survived 125 days. Also in recent personal conversation with renowned biologist, Mark Ebner, who is working on the tribal consent decree, he told us that while the, they factor in delayed mortality factor for lake trout, they do not for whitefish because it is a moot point. I care more than any other fisherman, whether commercial or sport, about whitefish sustainability because it is my livelihood. We follow the best practices to protect fish stocks, including slow lifting of our nets, fast sorting, and very loose bagging, um, and make sure to work before the heat of the day is, is upon us. We are also looking into some solutions for gilling in our, in our pots and ways to reduce bycatch. When, can you wrap I want it up, to see. Please? Could you wrap it up, please? Yep. 
Um, I want to see this fishery thrive for future Wisconsin fishermen, and this rule will allow that to happen. Thank you. Any questions for Will? None. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next one is J.J. Malvitz from Sturgeon Bay representing J.J.'s Guide Service. J.J. Malvitz, how are you? Morning, everyone. I uh, appreciate everyone taking the time to allow me to speak. I'm speaking today on the proposed rule FH-02-20 that affects Lake Whitefish Catch in the Bay of Green Bay. I am opposed to the large increase in commercial harvest, especially on of the potential increase of 800,000 pounds in the next couple of years. I am a native to Door County and a professional ice fishing guide based in Sturgeon Bay. I began guiding whitefish when I was 18 years old and in high school. That was a little over 12 years ago. The whitefish bite on Green Bay is like no other fishery in the country. There's no place that you can catch the quantity and size of these fish other than the Bay of Green Bay. It is truly a one of a kind fishery. The popularity of this unique fishery continues to grow exponentially among recreational anglers across the country. I have the, been privileged to take thousand, thousands of anglers from across the country to experience this fishery. All these anglers must buy a Wisconsin fishing license and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in local economies in typically a slower time of year. The push for this increase is coming from one of the lowest quota holders in zone one. Therefore, if this increase goes through, it will, they will gain additional quota for free. We have to treat this fishery as a natural resource and not as a commodity or stock. There has been a public outcry of people worried about losing their fresh local fish supply. If this, this rule will have no effect on people's access to fresh local fish. What I've also found very alarming to the fishery on Green Bay is there has been no collaboration with the Michigan DNR. There's a commercial license holder in Cedar River who has been the only trawler license for Lake Whitefish. This permit holder has a quota of over 600,000 pounds annually. None of the Wisconsin DNR's Lake Whitefish composition studies take into account this record harvest. This trawler out of Cedar River, Michigan has been documented on or over the Wisconsin-Michigan boundary west of Chambers Island. Whitefish have been documented to travel the entire length of Green Bay. They came from Lake Michigan into the Bay of Green Bay. These, cross, these fish cross state boundaries, they're wild animals. It's absolutely ludicrous to think that this trawler does not have an impact on the entire Lake Whitefish population in Green Bay. The abundance of whitefish in Green Bay is relatively new, just over a decade old. They have begun to spawn in many rivers that flow into Green Bay. I don't understand why we should increase the amount of harvest pressure in an area that is allowing the species to thrive again. There should be refuge areas in the Bay to limit commercial fishing pressure. This lake is changing. The species is changing. But what if the data is wrong? What if the model run is wrong? Maybe we're moving too fast because once this resource is gone, there's no going back. There's numerous examples of thriving fisheries going to shambles due to incomplete data or moving too fast. A good example is Lake Mille Lacs in Minnesota. Families and businesses were decimated by regulatory, regulatory constraints put on anglers. Simply put, if whitefish numbers crash, <clears throat> anglers will not return. Today, you, the Natural Resources Board, is the last line of defense to protect this nat natural resource from irreversible damage. Thank you. I'll yield back to the chairman. Uh, thank you. Any questions for JJ? Hearing none, next we hear from the Lake Michigan Commercial Fishing Board, Charlie Hendrickson, the esteemed Charlie Hendrickson, um, who has unlimited time, but understands the value of our time and the public's time, but he is here to tell us his opinion on what's transcribed and what the current rule in front of us has in store. Charlie? Uh, thank you, Chairman Frayne, Secretary Cole, and members of the board. Uh, I appreciate uh, being uh, able to testify today. Uh, there is a tremendous amount to uh, take in here, uh, and I will try to be brief and to the point. Uh, uh, I appreciate all the effort uh, you guys have put in over the years uh, in understanding this rule and working to, to make it fair. Uh, I, I right away have to say that uh, I appreciate JJ mentioning uh, Michigan. Uh, you know, that harvest has been going on in Michigan for 40 years, up and down the bay. 
And uh, while we have issues about it, uh, our DNR has not been able to uh, have any impact on, on how it's conducted. And there, there seems to be no interest by the uh, uh, Michigan DNR to look into it. But what the question I've asked repeatedly is uh, while we talk about fish spawning in Ocanto and Menominee, which is half in Michigan, uh, what about Cedar River and Whitefish River and all the other rivers up that coast? I mean, there, there's probably some Michigan contribution to this. So obviously not having shared resources isn't the best thing, but it's, uh, it, it's existed while this thriving sports fishery is developed. So uh, we're back to the, the main point here that our harvest is not a threat to the sport fishery. And this late angst and uh, uh, almost hysterical reaction to the idea that we're going to fish uh, a bit more fish uh, just doesn't sit right. Uh, we, uh, we've we been working on this for a long time. As, as uh, Todd Stooth pointed out, we have parameters of what we're going to discuss. And at the last minute, uh, some of this changed. Now, thanks to uh, some sensible uh, intervention, we're, we're nearly back to where we started. Uh, we do have two years of a freeze where we're going to uh, look at what's going on and uh, we're going to run the model. Uh, it's disconcerting to me because in all of this, we've talked about running the model in 2022 late, which would have been on the schedule that's been talked about all along. And now we're not going to run it until late in 2023. Well, that's going to put us at January 1st of 2024 back into this panic management that, uh, that, that we don't want to be in. Let's, let's run that model and let's have some discussions during 2023. We have uh, interested uh, UWGB. We've interested UW Stevens Point. As Will said, they're going to look at... Uh, some of these issues that are being raised. We also have opinions from the uh, uh, consent decree modelers that it's maybe not as big a deal as they think it is. Uh, so, so the idea that the whole burden, <coughs> excuse me, to prove a negative falls on us while at his own uh, admission, JJ says the sport fishery is growing exponentially. So I, I don't know why we should be limited uh, when they're not. Uh, the whole deal about the uh, restricted area, we're, we are very, very happy that it's been removed. Uh, some of those onerous uh, conditions to fish there might be a little over the top, but uh, it's probably something you know we can work around. So this is a this is a very complete rule. Uh, I've I've been appearing before your board. It's interesting you say you're in your 51st year. I've been appearing before this board for 40 years. I first appeared in 1981. So uh, this is uh, probably the second most significant change to commercial fishing that's happened during that time. Uh, and all these changes about modeling differently for the lake and the bay and uh, preserving our, uh, our unequal but, uh, but permanently allocated quota shares. Uh, are interesting and uh, uh, and important. Important. It's it's a modification we need. So, I guess uh, I would uh, urge you to pass this. I would urge you to make sure that uh, that we do uh, enact other ways to look at this fishery. That our DNR takes this uh, study that we conducted with complete transparency and open ourselves up to any scrutiny that was necessary and comes up with a monitoring system that can build on this and uh, we all can move forward uh, in, in unison. There's a lot of things we could work on together rather than being so adversarial. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Charlie. Um, let's bring Brad back. Keep Charlie on if you could, please, for questions. I would entertain a motion to get this on the floor for debate of FH0220 for approval. Is there a motion? Oh, move approval. Is there a second? Bill Smith? Second. Terry Hilleberg, second uh, for debate. Um, questions from the board? I think I'd like to turn the attention to Bill Smith. He's our fish liaison, shall we call you, Bill? 
Um, he's been at his nose to the grindstone this issue from the time he was assigned to do this. Uh, Bill, would you like to chime in and give us your take? And then I have questions from members for Charlie and for Brad. Uh, thank you, Doc. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be involved with this and to meet some wonderful people on all sides of the discussion. Uh, bottom line on this, I think the staff have hit a point of balance. They've been very responsive to concerns that were expressed in the public hearing process and the public input process. Uh, many, many people participated and the voices are strong on both sides. We heard tremendous support for the heritage of commercial fishing and for the supply of fresh caught Wisconsin fish for the restaurant and tourist industry. Very, very important. Likewise, we heard very strong input from the sport fishery. I heard voices like JJ's uh, saying the same thing. We have a world-class sport fishery in Green Bay. And the general message was DNR, be very careful and move slowly and be deliberate and do no harm to the sport fishery. I think that also is very important. Both of these are significant economic engines. And I credit the staff with a, a very lengthy process and a very thorough process and being open-minded and flexible to find solutions. I think this rule hits the balance between those concerns. And although some of the conditions are maybe somewhat unnecessary in some people's minds, I think they address the call to be careful, be deliberate, uh, be sure of your science uh, before moving forward and keep the health of the fishery foremost in mind. So I support what the staff have proposed. All right, any other questions for Brad or for Charles? Terry. Thank you, Doc. I wanted to uh, thank uh, Charlie and his group, uh, sports fishermen and women and Brad for working together to get to the end game here. Uh, this is one of those issues that uh, not everybody's gonna be happy. So as Bill mentioned, that this might be the sweet spot. I uh, also wanna appreciate uh, the uh, discussion I had with Brad and uh, also taking my comments and my concerns into consideration in the amended policy, because I was very concerned that we were being a little too aggressive with the initial proposal that 800,000 kind of bothered me and the fact that we incorporated an, another two years in this process, I think is very, very good. So hats off to everybody that came to the right conclusion in my mind to uh, move this forward. And then for us to be very uh, conscientious during that two year period to, to make sure that it was the right decision in the right direction. So uh, the two gentlemen on the line here, thank you very much for all your work on this. I know it was very contentious and uh, a lot of people are very opinionated about this and they're uh, trying to protect their own turf, which is what they ought to be doing. But uh, in the end, I think we have a nice compromise here. So thank you. Any other questions for these two? Uh, okay. I do. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, I too wanna thank everybody for this. We've been dealing with this for several years, um, but Brad, I do have a couple of questions for you. Um, why are we delaying the study for the model <clears throat> till 2023? We thought that within the framework of this rule that uh, specifically calls for the tax and the quotas to remain the same in 22 and 23, it, it may not make sense to start discussion of the model result, results already in 22. Certainly, what we'd like to do is at least have three years worth of new data incorporated in the model. And if the stakeholders, both sport and commercial, want to engage on that model of results and information much earlier than the summer of 23, that's certainly a possibility. Because uh, we will have that, we can incorporate those three years in the model and begin conversations probably as early as this fall uh, on, those, on those results, well, well ahead of the, the 2024 season. Okay. Um, and the last one, I'm a little leery all the time about setting quotas in rule. 
Um, do you feel that you have the adequate ability to lower that quota if the potential is there without a big long process? Because it is a permanent rule here. Yeah, that's really, uh, Greg, that's really the uh, whole premise of this rule package in that if in, in the rule, when we look at the total allowable catch, and I guess we're focusing on Green Bay here. So based on the Green Bay total allowable catch, beyond 2024, the maximum zone one could be is 800,000, if that's what's calculated uh, through this process. However, that's a maximum, which means we have the ability to go down from there based on the social political environment at the time. So there's a ceiling, but there isn't a bottom. So that, that can be adjusted in the future if, if members of the public stakeholders and, and this board believe it should be something else. But because, because the quota is in permanent rule, um, what process is, is what I'm getting at? Would it be an emergency rule process to lower it if we find it necessary? Or right. how would that work? Well, we would, we would uh, based on this rule is, is passed, we would then work with the stakeholders in the intervening two years and come before the board in the fall of 2023 with the new total allowable catch in Green Bay and what that would mean for the quotas for the 24 season, and then have a recommendation and debate on are those the appropriate numbers. And so okay. without coming back to the Natural Resources Board, the quotas would stay the same. So we'd have to come back if we want to keep the same for 24. If they go up or down, we're still in the same spot. And that's coming back to this group with a recommendation. Well, I understand in 2024, but... Okay. What if in 2022, we look at the data and decide, whoa, even 568,000 was too, too many pallets? What, what is I our process then to respond to the immediate um, results on the ground? Oh, I, 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 yeah, I see what you're saying. That because, because those numbers are set in code for the next two years, what would be the process? I may have to defer to Cheryl Heilman on that one, but I think we'd have to go through the normal rule process is one option. I don't know if there's an emergency option there, but maybe if we have Cheryl weigh in on that, it's a little bit beyond my expertise. Okay. Cheryl? Uh, uh, Cheryl Heilman, um, attorney for the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I think to change the quota for that two-year period where it's set in the rule, um, an emergency rule could be appropriate. Okay, thank you. Okay. I have, I have a question for Brad. Um, Brad, up until recently, the, the modeling and the ride-alongs and the science said that the commercial fishermen should go up to 800,000 up until recently. Is that correct? Yeah, it. I'll say that the, it set the Green Bay total allowable cash for the entirety of Green Bay at 1.176 million. And then it becomes a sort of where do you put these fish in the various zones? and and one of the original proposals was to have more in zone one than in zone two. Yes. Okay. So my, my point is like, is you guys had, had a difficult time and you took all the public testimony into account and, and um, I can appreciate the frustration the commercial fishermen have, but my point I want to make in this meeting is so it can be historically to go back to it is, is this commercial fishermen have a high degree of trust in what's happening here. Um, I think what, what we need to make clear, and I want to get your response, and I believe you already responded, but I just want to answer my question, is they have, they got, you know, short sheet here at the very last minute, and they want to know that the process, if the modeling demonstrates that indeed they can go up to 800,000 in that zone, that it's not going to be a huge process starting all over again. I mean, there'll be public input, and the board's got to weigh in. I get all that. But there's some there's some concern from the fishermen um, on the commercial side, and also concern from the sportsman side that we get it right, we got to get it right, and that's why I think this cautious approach is appropriate. Uh, we're taking a slower course than we had than we had two months ago on this um, on the briefing we had, and I think the board appreciates that. But I want to make it clear that the process, the cast kind of dove in a little bit. The process is it going to be fairly simple? The model comes in, the public weighs in, 
or are we going to be, you know, back a couple of years? I mean, tell us on, on record here so the commercial guys know that this is something that's really going to, you know, take place in a timely fashion if the science continues to confirm what the science has already told us. Yeah, I think two, two hallmarks and some, something I think that's getting missed a little bit here is that, you know, the best science that we have and the best information that we can utilize for a Green Bay uh, whitefish population model suggests that in its entirety, if we had 1.176 <clears throat> million pounds harvested by the commercial and 1.176 million harvested by the sport fishery, the current data suggests that's sustainable to the future. So that's point number one. Uh, however, as Bill Smith has said, and others have said on this call, a more conservative approach might be wise at this point as we ease into it, and hence for the lower number in a quota in zone one. Moving on to the future, you're right, we're gonna take the information that we have, add three or four years of information into the model, look to see what the new total allowable catch would be in Green Bay, and then have discussions among stakeholders, uh, either a long, longer period of time or maybe over a short two or three month duration. You know, what the model says we can harvest this many, what's the appropriate quotas to be put into zone one and thus into zone two and bring that recommendation before the board. We are definitely committed to running this model, you know, at least every three years and more if warranted as, as uh, Mr. Kazbazek suggests. And then coming back to this, to this board with recommendations to make sure we sustain this fishery in the future. So. I guess it'll be as short or as long as the stakeholders would like as they engage on this process on, on future numbers you know, for this fishery. All right. All right, any other questions for Charlie or for Brad? If not, let's vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Brad. A lot of work, a lot of effort. Bill Smith as well. Next one, request adoption of board order AM3119, proposed rules affecting chapter NR438 related to clarifying and updating air contaminant emissions inventory reporting requirements. Maria Hill, we have one written comment we had on this. Maria, how are you? I'm fine this morning, thank you. You have the floor. Thank you and good morning, Chair Prane, members of the board and Secretary Cole. My name is Maria Hill and I'm the Compliance Enforcement and Emissions Inventory Section Chief for the Air Management Program. Next slide, please. Today I'm requesting adoption of Board Order AM3119. Next slide, please. The Federal Air Emissions Reporting Requirements Rule requires states to report emissions data to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. There are currently some inconsistencies between Wisconsin's air emissions reporting requirements in chapter NR438 and the federal air emissions reporting requirements rule. The rule changes in board order AM3119 are being proposed so that the state air emissions reporting requirements are aligned with the federal requirements. Meeting these federal requirements will also ensure that Wisconsin has a legally sufficient state implementation plan. Without these changes, EPA will be unable to approve state implementation plan revisions relating to emissions reporting for certain pollutants. Next slide, please. To align the state code with federal requirements, the proposed rule incorporates a reporting requirement for direct emissions of particulate matter with a diameter equal to or less than 2.5 microns, also known as PM 2.5. The proposed rule will require facilities with larger amounts of air pollution to report all criteria air pollutant and ammonia emissions. This incorporation is also needed to meet federal requirements. To simplify the emissions reporting process for facilities, the proposed rule includes a list of emission units, operations, and activities that a facility may exclude from the annual emissions inventory. This proposed exclusion list covers emissions that are small and difficult to quantify. Additionally, the proposed revisions will modernize Chapter NR438 language to reflect the department's current emissions inventory reporting process. The AIR program drafted the rule language to minimize the administrative impact on sources relating to the time required to report and certify emissions. The proposed changes will not involve an emission fee increase for sources and will not require sources to install new emissions monitoring equipment or reporting systems. Next slide, please. 
During the rulemaking process, there have been several outreach activities to solicit feedback from the AIR program stakeholders. The department received and responded to two comments regarding the economic impact of the rule. The department received and responded to three comments requesting additional exclusions. The AIR program revised the proposed rule language to address all of the commenters' requests in a manner to ensure the rule is still aligned with federal emissions reporting requirements. The program expects the revisions to address the comments will reduce the administrative emissions reporting burden for facilities. The department also received minor comments of a clarifying nature from the Legislative Council Rules Clearinghouse, which were addressed in the final rule. Next slide, please. That concludes my presentation. And are there any questions from the board? Any questions from Maria? If not, entertain a motion, please. I move approval, Smith. Your second. Second, Kaz. Any debate? All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Maria, aye. well done. Thank you. Great. Thank you for your time. Request the board adopt germane modifications to board order WY 2313, proposed rules affecting NR 102 related to process for water body assessments and impaired water listing, biological assessments, thresholds, biological confirmation of phosphorus impairments, and water quality criteria for dissolved oxygens. We have one written comment. Maria Wilhite. Hi, Maria. Hi. Uh, actually, it's Marsha. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Marsha, sorry. Let me get my glasses. How's that? No worries. No worries. Um, there have been worse mispronunciations of my name. Um, good morning, uh, uh, Chairman Prane, Secretary Cole, members of the board. I'm Marsha Wilhite, the Water Evaluation Section Chief in the Water Quality Bureau. Um, next slide, please. Um, we're here to bring back some revisions to the water body assessments rule that you approved in 2019. Next slide, please. Uh, so we went through the um, adoption process and went to legislative uh, review of this uh, water body assessment rule. And um, at hearing, we heard some things that we thought uh, uh, we could work on. So we recalled the rule. Now we're bringing back the modifications that we made to the rule to address stakeholder comments. Next slide, please. As a reminder of what this rule is, it's, it's about um, how we use biology to assess the health of water bodies. Um, these uh, assessment procedures are ones that we have been using for years uh, to, to assess biology as other states and EPA uh, recommends be done. Um, it's uh, the best measure of, of the health of a water body for the aquatic life protection use and what this rule accomplishes is moving these assessment procedures into code, codifying what uh, our approaches have been over the years. Next slide. So here the we received comments at the legislative hearing on the original rule um, in three areas, mainly um, concern that the biological metrics proposed by the rule might impact permit limits. So to, to make very clear that this was not the case, we moved the assessment procedures and assessment thresholds out of the portion of NR 102 that um, contains standards that we do use for calculating permits, moved it into a section that's just for the uh, water body assessment procedures. Um, the next thing that we heard was a preference for numeric thresholds rather than a narrative uh, thresholds. Um, and we uh, uh, in included numeric thresholds for assessing the health of lakes. Um, we need to do some additional technical work on thresholds, numeric thresholds that would apply to rivers and streams. And we hope to come back at a later time with those numeric thresholds, but this was uh, the modification we could make at this time. There was also concerns that the, um, the thresholds that we were using for or proposing to use for uh, algae, um, there were concerns about that. Uh, we did some technical work uh, to confirm that the approach that we'd taken is very consistent with what other states use and what EPA recommends. 
Um, so we did not make a change to that particular portion. So to summarize, um, we made some substantive changes um, to the rule to address uh, comments from stakeholders. Next slide, please. So um, we uh, reached back out to the uh, um, external advisory group that we had worked with for two years on the development of the original rule to check in with these potential modifications. Um, we also included um, an additional public hearing opportunity to get um, comments and the, the substantive comments that we received were really just from uh, one set of commenters. So we, um, uh, we made some specific language changes in response to those um, uh, concerns, residual concerns that were raised at the uh, public hearing on the germane modifications. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on some of that in a moment. Um, next slide, please. But the, the bottom line is that um, these proposed biological metrics don't affect permit limits. Um, they, we, we have experience with using them. We, we know what the, the pathway is for, uh, that they are used for trying to identify what stressors exist in water bodies that are affecting the biology. Um, but uh, just to address um, some comments that you received uh, last week from, from uh, Wisconsin Manufacturers and Wisconsin Paper Council, um, they continue to, to be concerned about costs to regulated businesses. Um, but to be honest, we, DNR just doesn't see a mechanism by which this rule and the use of biological metrics will um, impact uh, and, and cause costs for businesses. Um, and in their comments, uh, uh, WMC and, and WPC didn't provide an explanation as to what they see would be the way that these costs would be incurred. And they're, they're typically not shy about saying, hey, you overlooked um, this potential cost, uh, but that information was not provided. So I just wanted to explain our thought process on this matter. Um, the biological metrics proposed in this rule, um, they can't be used as a basis for calculating permit limits and imposing new permit limits is a way that costs to businesses can occur. Um, so we don't see that as a pathway. That's why we keep saying that the metrics don't affect permit limits. Similarly, if we use these biological metrics and identify a problem with the biology and we um, list on our list of impaired waters that these water, uh, particular, particular water body has degraded biology. Again, that can't be used, that does not impose, uh, just being on the list does not impose a regulatory obligation on regulated businesses. Not until we identify that the cause of the degraded biology is a pollutant. So um, we've put explicit language in the rule that says that, that if there is a, a, a listing for um, degraded biology, the department needs to do additional work to identify, you know, what, if it is a pollutant. Um, it's not just pollutants that cause stress on biology. It can be the presence of aquatic nuisance species. It can be, um, uh, it could be, uh, unstable shorelines, there could be other habitat issues that, that contribute to degraded biology, not just pollutant. But until we know it's a pollutant, um, we've got no basis for calculating permit limits or developing a TMDL. And as I mentioned, we put explicit language in the, in the rule that, um, that says that, that the department will not develop a TMDL until we have identified that that pollutant is causing the biology problem. So um, I, that explicit language in the rule uh, addresses the concern in, in the recent letter about unknown pollutant. Another issue that was raised was um, using fish consumption advisories as a basis for uh, identifying impairments. Um, fish consumption advisories are inform the department's assessment of whether public health and welfare is being protected for a particular water body. This rule deals with aquatic life protection. And so that's why we said that 
um, fish consumption advisories are kind of outside the scope uh, for, these, for these modifications to this rule. We will have more to say about um, how we report um, unknown pollutants and, and uh, the issue about fish consumption advisories when we respond to comments that we received on our uh, proposed impaired waters list. And those comments are due April 1st. So we, we do intend to respond. Uh, and if the board is interested in hearing more about that, certainly we're willing to come back and, and provide more information about that. So um, I guess in summary, uh, we've, we have listened to what um, stakeholders have said, uh, and in particular, WMC and WPC made some substantial changes. We didn't change everything that they asked for, but we changed many things uh, to respond to that. Um, and what we have is, is a rule that will provide us um, a basis for making um, consistent assessments of the aquatic life health of our rivers, lakes, and streams, um, and get on with our job of, of solving uh, problems when we see water quality problems. Um, so we, we recommend and request that the board uh, adopt these modifications to the rule so that we can take it back to the legislature for their review. Any questions? Thank you, Marsha. Any questions for Marsha? Regarding this germane rule change. I, I have a couple. Yes. So Marsha, um, the report card that I look at as a board member and which is ultimately the goal of the department also is how many of these water bodies are we getting off that impaired list? Um, so with this rule, in your best judgment, are we gonna see a bunch of additional water bodies added to that list? Or is it kind of like grading on the curve here or we're changing the standard to get more bodies on the list or which way do you think it's gonna go after this rule? I don't think that this rule will result in more water bodies getting on because the um, we are codifying the assessment procedures and, and thresholds that we have been using for years. So those will the process will continue as we as we look at at additional water bodies. And in fact, there's a portion of this rule um, that uh, explains how we can use biology to keep things off the impaired waters list. If um, and this is the the phosphorus response indicators portion of the rule. So um, I don't anticipate that this rule will result in more listings. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Terry? Then Bill. Thank you. Uh, Marsha, on uh, page seven of the 80 plus white sheets, uh, it makes comment about that the EPA requires the state to uh, review this stuff every two years. What happens if the state doesn't? Well, um, we have in our in our grant work plan with EPA that that that's something that we're going to do. Um, as a first thing, we 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 uh, wouldn't be complying with the Clean Water Act because the Clean Water Act um, asks us to do this. Uh, but I would imagine that EPA would. Um, uh, be in very uh, stern conversations with us about getting that work done. Um, that's uh, one of our obligations and one of the things that we receive federal grant money to do. So if we don't do it, the bottom line is we don't get the money. Is that the deal? Well, it's possible. I, 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 you know, to be honest, I think EPA does everything they can to avoid taking, taking away money to get this important work done, but they would be, you know, um, taking whatever actions they can to, to make sure that it does get done. So our, our working relationship during your tenure anyway, has been very positive with the EPA on taking care of these kind of situations. Yes, we've got a good collaboration with them um, and we want that to continue. Yes, yes. Thank you. I was just curious as to what the process was or do the feds all of a sudden come in and take over your operation and they're gonna do it or how does that all work? 
Well, that's that's kind of the nuclear option, um, but it's it's something that that is a possibility. Um, most uh, a, a, there could be a petition for delegation of of program uh, responsibilities if a state is not fulfilling them. Thank you, Bill Bruins. Um, obviously, uh, coming from the business world, I have a a rather large concern when when a, a business, a very large uh, organization that represents businesses has a problem with this. Uh, I, I, I just, I just, I'm, I'm uncertain about, you know, your statement that uh, this new and improved way of measuring water quality is not going to add any waters to the 303D list. Um, and in the same, in the same vein, you say that, you know, you're, you're, you're including uh, unidentified uh, pollutants. Um, I, I, I'm just uncomfortable. Uh, uh, is, is PFAS uh, rearing its ugly head in any of this uh, water quality uh, consideration? Well, I'd, I'd make a few uh, uh, comments. First, um, these procedures are not new um, and the assessment approaches are the same ones that we've been using, um, but we've been using them um, under guidance. And this is, this, what this rule does is move these procedures into code. So it doesn't change the procedures per se, it just changes where they're located. And, and we have heard from stakeholders, they're more comfortable with the assessment procedures being in code rather than uh, only in guidance. Um, and so that's my, the basis of my um, statement that I don't believe there'll be um, listings occurring that wouldn't have occurred um, otherwise uh, as a result of this rule. Um, and uh, PFOS and PFOA, um, we are not focused on aquatic life impacts of those compounds at this time. We're really focused on public health. And as I mentioned earlier, this rule is really focused on how we assess uh, aquatic life separate from the public health and welfare use of water. So I would say no, um, uh, PFOA and PFOS are really not an issue for, for this rule. Not to mention the fact that, that let's say someday we have promulgated water quality standards that are addressing protecting aquatic life from those compounds. Um, that would be a situation where um, you'd have a basis for, for um, uh, doing a TMDL, for example, but because we know what the pollutant is as opposed to this rule, which is just saying, um, we're going to use biological metrics to help us understand is the biology healthy and we need to do more work. If we find that the biology is not doing well, we need to do more work to find out what's the pollutant that's causing the problem, or maybe it's habitat that's causing the problem. I, I, I understand your, your, your discomfort, um, but we've, we've tried really hard to try and address it um, and uh, have, haven't gotten some information that we can say, uh, you know, the, here's the pathway that we see to costs. What pathway do you see to costs? That, in, that information has not been provided for us to be able to respond to. So, so in, the, in this whole discussion um, or in this whole new method, uh, it's just a way of codifying it into rule, okay. Uh, what what consideration is given? Also, recently you you determined that uh, there was some PFAS identified in in rock bats uh, in some uh, water body, so you you issued a, 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 a you better not eat it very much uh, uh, ruling. Um, what what was the level of PFAS in in the rock bass? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, I don't have that information in front of me. Um, again, uh, the fish consumption advisory, that's what you were describing, 
um, is related to public health protection. And so that is not something that we use to assess whether, whether the rock bass populations are healthy. That's, that's really not the focus of the consumption advisory. Um, it's, it's the uh, biological metrics are used to identify is, is are uh, fish populations healthy? Are they the right diversity, et cetera? So what you're saying is that that uh, if the fish are not fit to eat in a water body, that that's not going to be play a part in in uh, determining water quality. It is, but not um, when we think about uh, water quality. We think about how we want to use the water. Um, we we want to make sure that one use of the water is that the aquatic life is protected. That's called a aquatic life designated use. Another use of water is to make sure that, that the public can recreate and eat the fish from the water. And it's, it's just a different approach uh, and look at um, uh, uh, assessment procedures. It gives us different information. That's what I'm saying. When, when, a, when a water body is listed as a 303D impaired uh, uh, what things have to happen to return that back to a non-classified status? Um, you mean to, to get things off the impaired waters list? Yes. Okay. Well, typically we are collecting um, chemistry and biology data on a regular basis over the years. And when we find that there's either a chemistry, you know, we're seeing exceedance of the promulgated water quality standards, or we're seeing a biology problem, that that causes something to be placed on the on the impaired waters list. Um, when we gather data that that shows that the level of pollution has gone down, or that the biology has rebounded, then we um, at our next um, reporting cycle to EPA delist, that's what it's called, delist those water bodies. And every cycle we are, um, yes, adding a few more water bodies, but also delisting water bodies. And that is um, something that we'll be reporting on um, in, uh, with an April 1st deadline to EPA. Well, now twice over, you've said that uh, you don't think that there's going to be any water bodies added to the 303D uh, list. Uh, I'll give you one more chance. Uh, are you, can you say that there will not be uncertainty? Well, let, let me clarify what I was saying. I was saying that as a result of this rule alone, I don't believe that there will be additional uh, water bodies added. Every two year, every year, we, we are doing assessments and we are adding to the body of knowledge and, and we using these same procedures, um, previously we're using them under guidance. Now they would be in code, um, but they are the same assessment procedures. So I, I'm not saying that, that, that because of this rule, there will never be any more listings. What I'm saying is that this rule will not result in additional listings that we would not have identified otherwise. Thank you. Any other questions for Marsha? Cass, let's vote, folks. Marsha or myself? Go ahead, Cass. Well, that brings up one other question. So when a, a water body is listed, where is the burden for cleanup? Is it, does that go to the landowners in that watershed or... Um, can you explain that to us? Sure. Well, um, if if the, the listing on the 303D list is for an identified pollutant, mm -hmm. then um, what that that can uh, lead to um, new permit limits for businesses that would discharge and have a permit to discharge into that water body. Um, if 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 it's a, a non-point source problem the pollutant is coming from non-point sources, then we have the same toolbox that we always have for non-point sources, which is um, we identify that there's a problem um, and here are the kinds of uh, practices that can reduce pollution that contribute to that problem. 
when there is a, a, a listing on the 303D list for uh, a biological problem, such as we're talking about with this rule, um, what that signals to us is that more work needs to be done to identify what the stressor is. Um, it, it's not immediately obvious that it's a chemistry issue, so we need to look at uh, invasive species or habitat or shoreline erosion or other kinds of things that can contribute to a biological problem. Having um, a water body on the 303D list actually um, gives uh, uh, landowners that surround that water body additional points for um, getting grant money to identify, you know, help identify problems, but more importantly, come up with solutions to reduce the water quality issues. Okay, so let's just use Dead Pike Lake as an example, because I believe that one is on the impaired water list, and it's a non-point source. Um, that is owned by the department. So what's the avenue to get a problem like that resolved when we are in charge of what's causing that pollutant? Well, um, I'm not completely familiar with the details on Dead Pike Lake, uh, but in general, what happens is um, if, if there is a, a biology or chemistry problem with the lake, then um, we, we look for where the sources of, of what's causing the problem to be done. And those who, who um, have control over those sources then have that responsibility. So I'm not sure what the uh, surrounding, if, if, the, if it's agricultural non-point source around Dead Pike Lake, then, then um, this comes into promoting practices, conservation practices that would reduce uh, whatever the cause is of, of problems for Dead Pike Lake. All right, thank you. All right, let's vote. Anybody else have any questions? If not, <clears throat> do we have a motion on the floor? <clears throat> I don't believe we do, do we? We do not. Move. Okay. Second, Kaz. Marcy, second. Actually, Mar Marcy made the motion. Mar WI 23 13. Kaz, you second? Moved and seconded. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Let's, let's stay on before break with and continue on with E. Uh, Doc, uh, you didn't ask for a opposition. Is there any opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Okay, next one is requested board adopt germane modification to board order WT 1712, proposed rules revising chapter NR 102 and creating chapter NR 119 related to establishing a process for developing site specific numeric phosphorus water quality criteria for surface waters. Good morning, it's me again, uh, okay. Chairman Prane and Secretary Cole, members of the board. Um, when we, uh, ne next slide. Next slide, please. So um, uh, again, this is a rule that was previously approved by the board. We took it to legislative review. Um, because of the concerns on the previous rule that we were discussing, the water body assessment rule, um, uh, this uh, language in this rule was referring back to that water body assessment rule. So we needed to recall both rules at the same time. Um, so we are simply updating uh, the cross references um, in, in this uh, uh, WT1712 um, to be consistent with the terminology that we have in, in the uh, rule that you just approved. Next slide. So to remind you what this rule is, is uh, we have authority to develop site specific criteria um, and we've been uh, using it for, for phosphorus in, in some cases. And uh, this rule, next slide please, establishes um, just statewide procedures for how that is done. We, we have authority in, in statute and code, um, but this really just explains how we go about um, making a demonstration for, for a, a site specific criterion. So we really just updated uh, cross references to the water body assessment rule, uh, updated terminology to be consistent 
Um, this rule has no um, economic impact and uh, we're just establishing a, a process. It doesn't require anybody to do any, but anything, but if someone does want to um, propose a, a site-specific criteria for phosphorus, that's what this rule lays out, how they would want to do that. Next slide. So we request that you also um, adopt this so we can also bring it back to the legislature and, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Any questions for Marsha on this germane modification to this rule that's already in place? Uh, Bill. Yeah, so I, I think I expressed concerns about site-specific phosphorus uh, uh, rulings uh, when we did the La Couture, I believe it was, uh, uh, deal. Um, I, I just, so, okay, so, so if, if we want to go, if, if, a, if a lake owner organization wants to lower the phosphorus recommendations uh, on any particular lake, and let's just say there's a CAFO uh, in the watershed, um, and, and, and the, the CAFO is abiding by all the existing rules and regulations as TMDLs are, are satisfactory. Uh, does that lake owner organization, if they're successful in lowering the phosphorus uh, levels, uh, does that have any impact or effect on that CAFO? Um, well, First, the, the, uh, whoever was proposing a site-specific criterion would need to demonstrate that the biology requires that the, that the level be lower um, and make that demonstration. And that's, that's what this rule kind of lays out is, is how do you do that? How do you show that the biology requires a different um, phosphorus criterion than, than the statewide one? And Marsha, I think, Marsha, hold on a second. It's a pretty Sorry. pointed question, Marsha. Let's, let's not go in circles here. The okay. question you had was about the CAFO regarding so, that. Let's assume the biology is all there. So um, I, I would say in general that, that the lower phosphorus level would be unlikely to affect requirements for the production area of the CAFO. Um, it's possible that it could affect uh, land application um, targets. So there's no definition between point source and non-point source in this particular rule. Well, CAFOs are kind of interesting because they're, yeah, they're, there's nothing in this rule that talks about point source versus non-point source. To answer your question, Bill? Uh, well, yes, it does. And my response to that is that I see some huge economic impact potential uh, for, for agriculture and for business uh, if, if we allow this uh, to go forward. Any other questions for Marsha? None? So let me put a motion up. I think we'll roll call, roll call. Terry? Marsha, with Bill's comment, um, was the information and work that, you, that the department did on this indicated that there's no economic impact, correct? Yes, because this rule establishes procedures and um, it's, it's, it's following the procedure that doesn't in, incur a cost on, an, on a regulated entity. If someone follows the procedures that this rule lays out and um, we go through a rulemaking to adopt a site-specific criterion, then potentially there could be costs to business as a result of uh, a, a site-specific criterion. But this rule focuses on what the procedure is, what information gets put forward to support a site-specific criterion. So Marcia, you're basically going to, uh, with this rule, allow any body of water, any repairing owner or any agency or whatever to cherry pick different bodies of water to bring forth to some, to affect some degree of change, correct? Well, 
the authority already exists. So um, absent this rule, we have the authority and we have done site specific criteria, as you recall for um, uh, like Pete and well, Castle Rock Lake and Lake Wisconsin. Um, and there could, and um, La Couture uh, is, is proposing a site specific absent these procedures. But what we wanted to achieve with this rule was having um, consistent procedures and, and people to know ahead of time what information needs to be provided to support a request for a site specific. Isn't Couder Ray and some of these other bodies point, non-point defined? We're, I believe we're told that the agriculture is not a point source. That's right, but that kind of, that's, that really comes down to um, once you establish the, the target, that's what the water quality standard is, whether it's the statewide standard or a site specific standard, that's the target for, for water quality, saying that water quality is good. So this process really just affects how we set that target. And um, after we've set a target, that's when we start to look at, um, are we meeting the target? You know. Uh, chemistry uh, sampling. Um, and then if we're not, and we need to list that for not meeting water quality goals, then we look for sources. Are there point sources? Are there non-point sources in the watershed that are contributing? So this is really way at the very beginning part of the process, which is what procedure do we use if we need to set uh, a site-specific goal for phosphorus in a particular water body? Very. Marshall, what happens if we don't approve the rule? Um, we won't have consistent statewide um, procedures for, for it, um, but it will not prevent um, either uh, members of the public, um, regulated entities, or the department from proposing site-specific criteria. Um, it really just establishes the procedures and information um, used to support a request. So when you, we, well, if we had that situation, then would you have to come in front of the board for that specific situation? We would, if, if we um, wanted to propose a site specific criterion for a water body, that would be a rulemaking that we would need to bring to um, the natural resources board. As we did with the site specific criteria a couple of years ago for um, Castle Rock Lake, Pete and Well yes. Lake in Lake Wisconsin. Yeah. Remember that. Thank you. So it's, it's it is a separate rulemaking. Um, just um, this this rule that we're proposing just establishes procedures. Marcy, Jerry, you done? This, Marcy, clar clarification, please. This this was a portion that was already adopted in 2019, correct? Yes. These germane modifications just um, make this rule consistent with the water body assessment rule. Um, for example, we don't we don't say bio criteria; we say biological assessment thresholds. Right. I just Bill in, Bill Bruins indicated the the adoption of the rule. The rule was adopted. These are germane modifications on the process. Thank you. Yes. Bill Smith, give your hand up. Oh. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Lori, let's roll call this, please. Do you need a motion? Uh, yes, we do. <laughs> How about a motion? WT 1712. Motion, motion to adopt the germane modifications to WT 1712. For a second. Okay, Lori, please roll call. William Bruins. Sharon Adams. Yes. Terry Hilgenberg. Yes. Greg Kazmierski. He's muted. Greg, you're muted. Yes. Marcy West. Yes. William Smith. Yes. Dr. Frederick Prane. Yeah, chair votes yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. We will take a 10-minute um, recess. We can be at 10.20, and we'll get into open form.
Thank you, everybody.
Okay, we ready to roll? Yep. Yes. Well, it's getting back to order of a slight recess. We're now at open forum. Uh, let's see, we have three speakers today. Each speaker will give them three minutes. To give their testimony. Please keep in mind the testimony threatens, intimidates, or makes disparaging remarks about board members, department staff, or other members of the public is unacceptable will not be allowed. The board welcomes this input on matters of natural resources management, department programs and policies, comments concerning individuals' personal information or business, business, personal business. And not appropriate would not be allowed. First one is Nicholas Christensen from Madison representing himself. I don't believe Nicholas is on the call. Okay, we'll go to the next one. Corky Meyer from Kowanskin representing Wisconsin Coon Hunters Association and Wisconsin Association of Sporting Dog Clubs. Topic, status of questions from 2021 spring hearing 34, 35, and 36. Corky, are you around? Yes, sir. Good morning. You hear How me? Are you? you bet. You have three just fine. Well, good morning, Chairman Payne, Secretary Cole, members of the board, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I've been receiving many calls, questions from all kinds of people about the status of these three questions. Uh, my answer to them is that, well, it got passed and supported through the Congress. It got passed on, and there are advisory questions. And I tell them that because it's advice. And as we all know, you can take advice or leave it. Uh, I've been involved with the process in Wisconsin that's unique to Wisconsin, the Congress, the board. I've been involved for over 40 years. Many of these questions I was involved with in helping uh, with the original rules. Um, my intent today, please, I want you to understand is not to gig anybody in the department, the board. We understand how busy you folks are. So uh, let me just say last week, the end of the week, I got a contact from the department staff that gives me hope. They're putting together a a uh, committee in the department to start looking at these issues. These three questions are just three of a bigger issue that the dog training, trialing uh, rules have been changed so often that the original intent of a lot of the rules has been lost. These three questions are just to uh, shine a light on what we feel is a loss of connection that goes back to as early as the 60s. And I'll say before my time, some of these, or one of these questions I'm one of the last surviving members of a group that um, was involved in the development. And I'll start with that, the northern third of the state. The intent was to control bear dog training. It had, we made arrangements to have permits. Well, that was all good at that meeting, but now in time, permits are being denied and permits are being revoked. Corky, you got, you're gonna need to wrap it up, Corky, please. Wow, that's quick three minutes. Okay, 
Well, it's actually a little more than three minutes, but please wrap okay. it up. Good. Let me finish with this. NR1.11 shows that the department's uh, efforts were originally to support dog training and trialing. And we have created so many rules. We want to get back to that original intent, the support of the department. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Any questions for Corky? All right, next one is Lori Grosskopf from Tomahawk, representing herself, professional and timely completion of deliverables and use of science and decision-making within the DNR. Lori, you have three minutes. Hello, all. Um, I am talking mostly about the wildlife staff and the science staff related to wildlife policies. There's been some really great people that I've really enjoyed knowing that are super professional and uh, also have field experience in addition to their academic preparation. Um, unfortunately, a number of those people have left for other jobs in other states. And so um, that's one thing that's very depressing to me. Uh, one thing that I'd like to basically communicate is basic customer service qualities that the department needs to pay more attention to, to get over this current impasse that we're having. Um, timely meeting notices, that's really important. Plain language policy, posting agendas on every public meeting notice, including citizens early in all management and policy discussions, because the citizens have a lot of field know-how to contribute to this actual development. Um, performance measures and time lights, limes that are reasonable. And these are some of the basics of good management. Uh, more input is better and making internal decisions by a few people is not being helpful to the process. So we need to open that up to more public input. Uh, we miss opportunities and we make mistakes by decisions made internally by the DNR. We miss opportunities by not allowing citizen input, not allowing committees to meet or to have meaningful dialogue. Science well done is good. Field experience is also good and we need to rely on the many people out in the field that have this experience. Use the expertise of the public. So I just like to end by saying the Chinese character for conflict is a combination of the character for crisis and opportunity. And I think the things we've gone through in the past few years are an opportunity for us to improve. Thank you. Any questions for Lori? Thank you, Lori. Next item is request adoption of board order WA0720 proposed rules creating chapter NR159 related to regulating fire foam firefighting foam that contains an intentional added uh, PFAS, Minnie Johnson. We have one public appearance on this. Good morning. I am Mimi Johnson, Director of the Office of Emerging Contaminants in the Environmental Management Division. I'm here today to request the adoption of the final draft permanent rule for board order WA-720 relating to PFAS containing firefighting foam. You can go to the next slide. And you can go to the next slide. For some historical and statutory context, since September 1st, 2020, we've had a state statute prohibiting the use of Class B firefighting foam containing intentionally added PFAS. This law has two exceptions when used as part of an emergency firefighting or fire prevention operation, or when used for testing purposes if appropriate containment, treatment, and disposal or storage measures are in place. Next slide. That same law also required the DNR to promulgate both an emergency and a permanent rule to implement the statute. The main elements of the rule relate to the notification and record keeping of use or discharge of foam and the storage containment treatment and disposal to prevent discharge of foam to the environment. The NRB approved the emergency rule in October 2020. The rule became effective in December 2020. Portions of the emergency rule were suspended by JCRAR in December 2020. And in light of statutory requirements, this permanent rule before you reflects the emergency rule as suspended by JCRAR that is currently in place. So with that, I thank you for your time and I would like to ask the board for approval of this permanent rule. Okay, any questions for Mimi? Mimi. Terry. Yeah, uh, Mimi, uh, 
what were the reasons that the joint committee rejected portions of the rule? Um, I don't know that I can speak to their their reasoning, um, and I don't know if Cheryl has has anything um, related don't to they that have, as well. But don't they have I would defer the, to JCRIR for their suspensions. I think the question no. wasn't what's the reasoning. The question is what did they take out of the rule? Cheryl or Mimi can answer that. Mimi, do you want to go ahead, or do you, would you like me? Um, I, I can, so they, they largely took out uh, the table that we had, had put in um, that offered some parameters or suggestions for treatment goals. Okay, so this permit rule, doesn't it go through the same process? It does not include that. So any of the suspensions they took out, all of those components are not included. There's a statutory requirement that we cannot address anything that was suspended by JCRAR. Oh, okay. So those are not included at this time. It is the emergency rule as suspended by JCRER that we're proposing as a permanent rule. So everything that's in this rule was approved by the joint committee. Correct. Okay. Thank you. I think this is a, this is an interesting because this doesn't happen a whole lot. But uh, when the board debates rules and regulations, as we all know, I think this is quite a topic of debate. When it happened, the vote was split over this table, it goes across the street. And this is the Act 20, I believe. This is the power of the legislator. They can they can cherry pick it, uh, just like the government can line item veto. And they cherry pick the table. And so therefore it came back to us and now we pass it without the table in it. So I think we have to be very conscious of the fact that uh, what we pass doesn't always get through legislative review. And this is a prime example how the majority of it does, but not all of it. Any, let's put a motion on the floor for WA 0720, please. Oh, excuse me, Jeffrey Lamont yeah. from Fort Washington. Jeffrey, how are you? You wanna address this, please? You have three minutes, Jeffrey. Yes, sir, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Lamont, and I live in the PFAS groundwater plume from the Tyco JCI Fire Training Center in the town of Peshtigo. My wife at this point and I have been on bottled water for four years for cooking and drinking. Our county of Marinette has over 3,500 acres of contaminated property from over two decades of biosolids spreading on agricultural lands around our community. In fact, just recently DNR just approved another land spreading application for the town of Peshtigo that have PFAS contaminated biosolids. These biosolids were contaminated through the direct discharge of PFAS into the sanitary sewers of Marinette and Peshtigo. I am here speaking today in favor of the permanent rule NR-159, uh, allowing Class B firefighting foams with intentionally added PFAS to be used for emergency firefighting, fire prevention and testing, as long as certain requirements are met this rule would go a long way in preventing what has happened in our community and others throughout the state by her prohibiting the flushing, draining, and discharging of AFFF foam into storm and sanitary sewers. It also provides for proper containment, treatment, and disposal and storage of these products. When PFAS contamination was first discovered in our community about four years ago, uh, there were about 30 PFAS sites in the state with contamination. Today, there are over 90. This problem will not go away without an important legislation like this. In summary, I support this important step forward to protect our air, lands, and waters of our great state and the health of its citizens. Thank you. Any questions for Jeffrey? Terry. Jeffrey, it says that you're from Port Washington, but you mentioned you're in Peshtigo? Uh, yes, sir. I, uh, I was born and raised in the town of Peshtigo, and I, ha I, I live in uh, the town of Peshtigo about seven months of the year. And I come south for the warmer winters down here in Port Washington. <laughs> oh, good good <laughs> luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're welcome. All right. Can I need, I need a motion to bring this on the table, please? WA0720. Move approval. I'll move. Uh, who made the motion? Terry? There a second. Bill Smith? Sorry. Bill Smith. Any debate? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Request adoption of board order WM 1820, proposed rules affecting chapters NR 10 and 45 related to 2021 wildlife management spring hearing rule related to hunting, trapping, and target shooting. Scott Carroll, how are you? Good, how are you? Good. Good, uh, good morning, Chair Prane, uh, Secretary Cole, members of the board. So we're requesting adoption today of WM 1820. This rule would codify the five questions that we the Bureau of Wildlife Management asked at the April 2021 uh, joint spring hearings with the Conservation Congress this spring. So just as a recap, um, you know, the board has seen these questions in the past, but the rule would specifically do five things. It would extend the date of the gray and fox squirrel seasons to coincide with the closing of the cottontail rabbit season. It would allow the department to regulate target shooting on department properties in Columbia County. It would return to a three zone mink, uh, mink and muskrat framework. Uh, there's currently a, a statewide zone and this was put in a request by uh, some trappers or, or a user request. Uh, it would also increase the time that cable restraints would be allowed during the regulated trapping season to co it would basically allow them for the full uh, trapping season rather than begin on December 1st. And then finally, it would allow falconry to take place on the Richard Bong State Rec area after the 2 p.m. closure. Uh, so that's the rule in a nutshell. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might, might have. Hey, hold on, stand by, Scott. Guys, let's get the public speaker, Mark Silverman from Milwaukee, representing Wisconsin Animal Protective Protection Society. Mark, how good are you? Good morning. You have three very, minutes, very good. Welcome. Thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity to comment. Um, I am Mark Silverman. I'm the president of the Wisconsin Animal Protection Society. And we believe in showing respect and appreciation for animals. We do not believe in hunting or trapping. And we say that uh, you should carry a camera instead of a gun, uh, mount a picture on your wall, not a head. So uh, we oppose adoption of WM 18-20. And although with the exception of the portion allowing the department to regulate target shooting. We have no position on the target shooting, but uh, other than that, we oppose uh, uh, WM1820 the way it is written. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions for Mark? Hearing none, need a motion, please? WM1820. Bill Bruin, so moved. So Bill Bruin, second. Okay, a second. Any questions for, for Scott before we vote? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. On the scope statements, request that the board approve the statement of scope for board order PR0320 and conditionally approve the public hearing notice and notice of submittal of proposed rules to legislative council rules clearinghouse for proposed rules affecting NR 5, 10, 11, 15, 17, 20, 26, 27, 45, and 51 related to Wisconsin DNR property management regulation. Bridget Brown, Recreational Management Section Chief, Bureau of Parks and Recreation. Bridget? Good morning and thank you. So I'm you? here today to request your approval of the scope statement for this board order related to management of DNR property. Slide, please. So at the request of the legislature, we did hold a preliminary public hearing on the statement of scope in November of last year. We had attendance from three members of the public and no members of the public chose to speak at the hearing and no comments were received during the public comment period. Slide please. This rule package will be focused on rules for management of department lands. A number of administrative code chapters will be impacted, but the main focus will be chapter NR45, which is titled Use of Department Properties. Topics covered will include the structure of some fees, general and specific property rules, recreational uses, and regulations to meet public health and safety and resource management goals. We will also do some general housekeeping of NR45 for overall organization and readability. 
We are also currently conducting and analyzing public survey work to help inform this rule package on a variety of topics, such as special events, pets, noise, and camping. Slide, please. So in closing, I ask for your approval of this statement of scope for board order PR 0320, and I'm ready for any questions you have. Thank you for your time. Any questions for Bridget? Yeah, I have one. Okay, Kaz. Yeah, I'd just like to, to uh, have her reiterate that the decision to remove the fence and shut down Sand Hill is not going to be included in this package. Correct. Uh, okay. That decision will not be part of this uh, rule package. All right. Thank you. Any other questions for Bridget? Hearing none, I need a motion. Sharon, you're muted, Sharon, but I assume you're making a motion. Well, unmute, please. So move. So move. Is there a second? Second. Second by Marcy. Any debate? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Bridget. Next, I request that the board approve statement of scope for emergency board order WM1521E for proposed rules affecting NR10 related to establishing the 2022 migratory bird season framework and regulations. Once again, Scott, we have one public hearing, public appearance. Hi, good morning again. Uh, as many of the members of the board are probably aware, this is an annual item that uh, Bureau of Wildlife Management brings forward. We need to have our decisions for migratory bird seasons to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service by April, the end of April of this year. At the April meeting, our migratory bird specialist, Taylor Finger, will come and present uh, the, our, our emergency rule, essentially establishing the bag limits and quotas for our fall migratory seasons. So, um, you know, again, this is just kind of an annual step that we take. I will mention this likely will probably be our last year of doing just simply emergency rule, uh, a one year setting of a framework. We're going to start exploring uh, extending the or setting our frameworks for a little bit longer. Uh, for, uh, we're going to start out for about two years, then go out hopefully for a little bit longer to, for that period of time. But that's something we'll keep the board aware of in the future when we do decide to make those decisions. Um, so with that, I, I'd ask for approval for the scope statement so we continue work on this rule. Any questions for Scott? If not, we have one testify, testimony from Scott, from Mark Silverman again. Mark, from Milwaukee, Wisconsin Animal Protection Society. Thank you very much again, Chairman. So um, we, the Wisconsin Animal Protection Society, opposed uh, adoption of WM15-21 in reading the uh, statement of scope, we see that failure to modify our rules will result in the failure to provide hunting opportunity and continuation of rules which conflict with federal regulations. We, because we oppose hunting, uh, we, we are happy that uh, if it's not modified, that there will not be hunting opportunity provided. So um, our position is to oppose WM15-21. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mark? Hearing none, I need a motion for a statement of scope for WM1521E. So moved, Kaz. Kaz, second. second. Terry. Okay. Terry, second. Any debate? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Next, we have miscellaneous uh, request approval of department recommendations for 2022 bear harvest quotas. Randy Johnson, large carnivore specialist. We have one written comment and we have two public speakers. Let's hear from Randy first. Randy, you on Randy? Yes, I'm here. Can you guys hear me? You bet, we got you. Okay, I think my video is going, but I see the presentation is up, so I'll jump right into it. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Chair Preen, Secretary Cole, uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is Randy Johnson. I'm the large carnivore biologist for the department and here to present the uh, bear season recommendations for 2022. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, one slide to quick review uh, last season. Uh, the most important change was that last season was the first season 
following the new zone structure. Uh, the new bear zone structure was uh, part of the bear management plan, which was approved a few years back. And the purpose of these new zones uh, is to better reflect the bear population distribution across the state uh, to allow us to uh, respond better to uh, bear human conflicts, particularly in the Northwest uh, and uh, the, the southward expansion of the bear population. <clears throat> Uh, there's some animation. Yeah, there you go. Can you click one more time, please? This doesn't work as well over, over Zoom. <laughs> uh, one more click, please. It should show some harvest numbers. There we go. Uh, so last year, the, the total harvest was around 3,800 bears. Uh, overall, this was below our harvest target. Um, the average harvest over the last decade has been around 4,000 bears, uh, usually on one side or the other of that number. Um, and, and so these, these numbers are similar um, however, the distribution of this harvest uh, was, was different than it has been, and this is obviously a reflection of the zones. Uh, the graphic there shows the last four years of harvest. The darker colors uh, represent uh, game management units that registered uh, higher levels of harvest. And so you can see that over the, the 2018, 19, and, and 20 seasons, uh, Douglas, Bayfield, uh, some of the counties in the far northwest uh, typically led in harvest, <clears throat> whereas in 2021, uh, that harvest shifted southward into Rusk and Sawyer counties. Uh, the, the little table there shows Rusk as the number one uh, county of harvest. Sawyer was close behind Washburn, Price, Burnett, uh, rounding out the top five. Um, and this is important. This was Again, one of the objectives of the new zones was to move some of that harvest uh, from the northern counties and uh, apply that pressure uh, in some of these counties like Rusk and Sawyer that have experienced uh, the historic uh, higher agricultural damages, uh, as well as the most bears being relocated. Uh, zone D, uh, which is that smaller zone in the northwest, did fail to reach its uh, harvest quota uh, but that area still saw the highest harvest it's seen in, in at least a decade. So it will probably take several years to see, uh, to continue to see how this harvest in this area uh, potentially affects agricultural damage. But uh, a review of the first year shows uh, that the zones so far seem to be performing uh, as desired. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. So uh, a quick review of how these quota recommendations are developed. Uh, it begins with our uh, Bear Advisory Committee. And this committee consists of DNR staff from across the state, uh, including biologists, law enforcement, customer service, uh, our conflict program, et cetera, uh, as well as 11 partner groups that represent uh, hunting organizations, agricultural organizations, land manager organizations, um, as well as we have a, a Glyphwick representing a Glyphwick rep uh, who represents the Ojibwe tribes uh, on the committee. <clears throat> uh, this committee met in early December uh, to review the bear season, the, the, the bear conflict program over the last year. Uh, and then we evaluate uh, population model information uh, at, at the zone level. We look at each zone independently uh, and review both where the population estimate is at in that zone and then we review uh, trends of six criteria. Uh, these criteria are identified in the bear management plan and they're listed on the screen. Uh, they're in no particular order, uh, but nuisance complaints, these would be things like uh, campgrounds, getting into trash cans, things like that. Uh, number two, agricultural damage, uh, primarily uh, cornfields, um, as well as uh, apiaries, things like that. Uh, hunter satisfaction and hunter crowding and conflict. Uh, these are measured through our uh, hunter surveys. Uh, success rates uh, measured based on uh, uh, harvest levels. Uh, and then finally, data on bear health, things like any emerging uh, disease concerns or drops in, in the bear population, things like that. So the committee, the, the committee reviews each of these criteria uh, for each zone. Uh, and looks at where things are at uh, to develop a population objective. Do we want this bear population to increase, maintain, or decrease? Um, and then we take that information and look at 
population projections from our model. This allows us to evaluate how different levels of harvest uh, will move that population uh, if that level of harvest is achieved. Uh, through that discussion, uh, we arrive at a quota, and then the final step in the process is to uh, take that quota and, and evaluate past uh, hunter success rates to determine the number of permits uh, to make available to achieve that level of harvest. Uh, next slide, please. So with that background, uh, I'll go through uh, each of the six zones, uh, and then we can open it up for discussion or questions. Uh, so for zone A, uh, the committee evaluated all that information, uh, arrived at a population objective to maintain. Uh, to achieve this, uh, the recommendation is a quota of 1,075 uh, and 1,805 licenses based on historical hunter success rates. Uh, both of these are a slight decrease uh, from the previous year, um, a slight decrease. Uh, zone B, uh, you can click once more, please. There we go. Uh, zone B, similarly, the, uh, the population objective here is to maintain uh, the bear population where it's at currently. Uh, to achieve this, uh, we're recommending an, uh, a quota of 800, uh, making available 1,430 licenses. Uh, both of these are, are modest increases from last year um, <clears throat> in this zone. Uh, please click once more to zone C. Uh, this is the central part of the state. Uh, again, uh, this zone also has a maintain objective, and we are recommending uh, identical quota and licenses to last year, uh, 600 bears, 3,000 licenses. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, zone D, uh, this is the zone in the northwest part of the state that, as I mentioned, uh, has had a history of high levels of agricultural damage in many areas and uh, sees most of our bear relocations take place. Uh, similar to last year, we're recommending a, an objective to decrease this bear population and a, maintaining a quota of 1,800 in this zone, making available 3,680 licenses. Uh, this is the same quota as last year, uh, but a slight bump in licenses based on success rates uh, last year. Um, Click, thank you. Zone E in the Southwest. Uh, this has a smaller but growing bear population in this zone. Uh, based on discussion and feedback, the objective here is to maintain this bear population, essentially slow the growth of the population and maintain where it's at. Uh, to achieve this, we're recommending a quota of 200 with 2000 licenses. Uh, both of these are again, modest increases from last year. And one more click. Thank you. Uh, zone F in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, this zone was created uh, essentially containing most of the unsuitable habitat in the state uh, with respect to bear. Uh, we do have a, some bear numbers in the northern stretches of this, this zone. <clears throat> uh, the objective with this zone is, is a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's to allow local control of the bear population. And to do this, we're recommending a quota of 25 bears, uh, making available 250 licenses, uh, both a uh, slight decrease from last year uh, from 30 and 300. Uh, one more click, please. Uh, so to total it all up, uh, overall a quota of 4,500 bears and 12,165 licenses, uh, both representing slight increases from last year, uh, just based on the tweaking within each zone uh, that we just went through. Uh, with that, I can, uh, well, let me add one point. I'll, I'll just mention the, the overall spirit of the discussion uh, among the Bear Advisory Committee was, I, I think, a desire for status quo. Again, we had a, this was the first year with the new zones, uh, the first feedback on those new zones, and I think the committee largely wanted to see another year of similar levels to continue to gain information with these new zones and, and evaluate uh, how they're working out. So with that, I will take any questions. All right, stand by, Randy. We have two speakers. First one is Tony Blatter for the, from Phillips, representing Wisconsin Conservation Congress as chair, advisory to the board. Tony, um, want to chime in? Yes, yeah, sir. Chair Prane, Secretary Cole, and members of the board, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today regarding the recommended bear harvest quotas for 2022. I am Tony Blattler, chair of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. The DNR staff participated in our recent uh, Conservation Congress Bear Committee 
uh, Zoom meeting and the proposed quotas that are before you today were presented to the committee and they were supported. The WCC feels the permit levels recommended are reasonable and appropriate given the goals, current population estimates and success rates identified utilizing the best available science. The Congress respectfully requests the board approve the recommended bear harvest quotas as presented by the department for our 2022 season. As an aside, I would like to thank the department for their continued engagement with the WCC on these important resource management issues. The WCC is proud, is proud to be part of the current system that Wisconsin utilizes to gather public input and feedback on resource related proposals. Our system is unique and it works. The fact that we have been utilizing the Wisconsin Conservation Congress for over 80 years as a conduit for the public to participate in the management of our resources and that Wisconsin is viewed as a leader in conservation is no coincidence. Of late, there have been numerous rumors that there is an effort underway to limit the participation of the NRB and thus the WCC as an important partner and voice of the public. As chair of the Wisconsin Conservation Congress, the only statutorily created organization that provides an avenue for public input to the DNR and to the NRB on all matters under their jurisdiction. I would like to reiterate our support for the current system of engagement and collaboration among these organizations. We look forward to continuing to provide a conduit for the exchange of information and ideas between the DNR and the public. And I'd like to thank you for your time. Any questions for Tony? Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Mr. Secretary. Uh, Tony, thank you for that message. It's, um, it doesn't fall on deaf ears. So as secretary and certainly having been a board member, and while I don't want to speak for Natural Resources Board, um, you and your organization is instrumental in natural resource management in the state of Wisconsin. So as we team up and work together, along with the Conservation Congress, the Natural Resources Board, and the DNR, this unique circumstance is a big deal for us in Wisconsin. This is Wisconsin's way. And thank you for reminding us all the importance of us being able to work together to solve some of uh, nature's and our environmental problems and go forward. So thank you again. Thank you for those comments, and I will make sure and take those back to our members. Tony and, and I speak for the NRB board. I mean, we've always respected the relationship we had between the two sides. And there really isn't two sides, we're on one side. And the COVID has been extremely difficult with not having the face-to-face -face meetings we have. The ch we chatted two years ago, I think, at downtown at a dinner one time. And since that time, it's always been on Zoom. I'm hoping that as the pandemic, you know, slowly winds out of this society that, you know, the NRB and the Congress and members of the Congress can rub elbows again and get feedback because this NRB does not operate in a vacuum, never has, never will. Um, and we respect what the Congress has to say along as the other sports and groups in the federations in our deliberations when we deal with resource management. So I mimic what the secretary says that they have the NRB as well. Thank Anything you else? For those. Okay, thank you. Uh, board, let's go back to our uh, second one. Let's do Mark Silverman real quick. Mark, you have three minutes representing Wisconsin Animal Protection Society. I got a feeling I know what you're going to say, but go ahead. <laughs> Is this a, does this give a clue? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, uh, the Wisconsin Animal Protection Society opposes bear hunting in any form, trapping. We um, oppose approval of the 2022 bear harvest quotas. Very interesting that uh, that you mentioned the COVID pandemic. You know, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for our treatment of wild animals. Probably they're saying that it was a virus that jumped from wild animals to man at uh, to uh, humans at the wet markets. And uh, it's just another example of our mistreatment of wild animals. It's bad for humans, but uh, uh, overall, uh, we think that there's another way and we hope that hunters can learn that it's fun being in nature without shooting something except for a camera. And that uh, one day people will change their attitudes towards wild animals. Uh, on a personal note, I've been a vegan for 38 years, uh, no meat, no fish, no dairy. 
for 38 years. And not only is it good for the planet, good for the animals, it's good for your own health too. So um, I'm lucky, knock on wood, that I continue to have great health. Uh, so thank you again uh, for the opportunity to comment. Right, Stay thank warm. You. <laughs> thank you. Board, board uh, members, um, Randy is on the call. Any questions for Randy or the process or the numbers? Terry? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I want to thank Randy for the uh, lengthy briefing we had yesterday. I appreciated that. Uh, but I had several uh, additional questions. Um, on slide six, if in the future, Randy, you can put what the actual results were for the, that year. In other words, you got the quota and that stuff on there, but it doesn't tell you what actually happened in 2021. So in the future, if we could have that information, that would be good. Um, the one concern that I have in the process is Randy went through the, I think it was six steps of, of uh, getting input and so forth. But the input from hunters is specifically and exclusively to bear hunters. It does not include any other hunters. And um, as I think all the members are aware, our deer camp is up in Florence County. And we get a lot of bear, a lot of bear. And uh, a lot less deer. So... I think it would be important to try to get the input of those folks also in that process of when we're establishing our, our goals. Uh, the second one that I would ask Randy to comment is uh, what's our overall population goal for bear in the state of Wisconsin? Sure. Yeah. Good questions. Um, <clears throat> first to your question on the, the input from deer hunters, um, we do actually have a, a number of, I think those groups represented in our committee. I, I didn't list the groups out, but we have the Bow Hunters Association on, um, we have the Bear Hunters Association. Um, but I think through the Wildlife Federation, the Conservation Congress, some of those uh, interests are, are represented through that. <clears throat> um, to the second question, the short answer is we do not have a bear population objective. We don't have a number. Um, historically, I think, as I mentioned on the phone yesterday, I believe the states had two bear plans. Uh, the first was from the 1980s, and I think that did establish uh, particular numbers. I think they were, I, I shouldn't even speculate on what those numbers were, um, but through updating the plan a few years ago, uh, the, the committee and the decision was made to move away from specific numbers and focus more on uh, what I had on the screen, you know, looking at uh, those items that are important to the different groups, um, including bear health, where's, what's the size of the bear population in each zone, looking at conflict levels, looking at hunter uh, satisfaction and success, things like that. And so I don't have a good answer for you on what is the, the, the number of bears that we want in this state. Um, I can tell you how many we estimate we have, and I can. Okay. You know, how many is that? Yeah, it's uh, the, the if you add up each zone, the total population is around 24,000, according to our mm -hmm. our population estimates. Um, but again, we, we look at those criteria zone by zone, because what's more important in one zone might be less important in another zone. And so we, we try to apply uh, the data and the science in each zone and then move the population up or down or maintain it uh, accordingly. Do we publish, Rand, what the uh, population is in each zone then? If we, if we look at what our goal is and so forth in each zone, shouldn't we also include that in our analysis here that, uh, in your charts? So we yeah. Know them all? Yeah, it's, it's technically, that's what those little charts are, but I, I, re I realize those are hard to see on this slide here. Um, that shows the trend as well as the uncertainty in those estimates. Um, so I don't think it's on the screen anymore, but um, we also publish those uh, post-season surveys, the, the harvest reports, the population analysis, those reports are, are placed on the, the website. If you could add that to table six also, I think that would be helpful for us. Absolutely. <clears throat> appreciate that. You bet. And I very much appreciate your enthusiasm for the program. Thank you. You bet, thank you. Okay, anybody else? Kaz? Um, so Randy, uh, great job on your presentation there. 
Um, I do have a couple of questions for you, and I, I'd like to reiterate on Terry's point. Um, one of the criteria or metrics, I believe, should be impacts of bear population on other species. Um, we get that clamor all the time from the public out there, the hunting public. Some are bear hunters, some are not, but large carnivores do have an impact on other species on the landscape. We've done several studies on it, um, spent millions of dollars. Kaz, you're a little froze up here. Kaz. Kaz? Hello. Hey, you froze up. Yeah. 25 seconds. I think we're going to move on. Kaz, you back to you if you can get this fixed, Kaz. Who else had their hand up? Bill Smith. Kaz, we'll come back to you. Get, get your audio rep figured out. Bill Smith. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Randy, I've got a couple of questions specific to Zone D. I happen to live there, and I know some of the local bear hunters. Um, first of all, uh, your criteria for establishing uh, quota includes hunter satisfaction and conflict. Zone D is the area of the greatest change in the last year with the reconfiguration and also a significant number of uh, permits. And the... Uh, points needed for a license was really critical because it's down to two. So anybody with a low number of points that wants to hunt, they're all coming to zone D. Um, in your evaluation, what did you find in terms of hunter satisfaction and conflict with regard to the changes in zone D? Yeah, excellent question. Um, <clears throat> so after the season, we send out uh, hunter questionnaires, hunter surveys, and you know we've gotten those back. That's being compiled right now. So I don't have an official data-driven answer for you yet, uh, but we will have that shortly. Um, but among the committee's discussion, uh, we you know we reached out to various groups to to bring that feedback to us, and largely the the response we got was uh, not significant conflict. Uh, it did not seem to be significantly crowded. Um, there was discussion among several groups related to the use of dogs in certain areas, um, some, you know, individual trespassing issues, things like that. Um, however, I'm not sure those were driven by the changes. I, I think some of those are longstanding issues. Um, so I, I think based on the anecdotal feedback so far is that satisfaction was in a positive place and uh, hunter crowding, you know, we hadn't hit a limit of, of significant crowding. And, and so we'll, we'll see what the data shows once we get the surveys back and, and that'll be used, you know, in future years. Yeah. The, the thing I heard was very anecdotal. It was very site specific and it was more toward the boundaries of zone D and where it abuts with uh, adjacent zones. And there was a, a shift of pressure into zone D from outside. So when I say conflict, I don't mean uh, fisticuffs. The conflict they have was just people inadvertently and unknowingly bumping into one another in their hunting efforts and the pressure was a little higher so it was disruptive of people's hunting to a greater degree than it had been in the past and it affected their success and their satisfaction um, i don't know how to compare that around the state and i'm glad you're looking at it very closely the other thing i heard from them is uh, similar to what you reported they said uh, it's uh, you know new zones new quotas uh, hold the course. Uh, don't make dramatic changes. They felt last year's success rate was lower than it had been. But because there was a very healthy uh, natural food, mass crop, berries in the area, that the bears uh, did not respond to bait as well as they have uh, in a normal year. The other thing was the increased activity in the woods from interest and hunting pressure. They felt that that increased activity uh, put the bears off the bait early in the season. And it was um, <clears throat> dog first, so there was a lot of dog activity with uh, guides coming in with hounds in areas they weren't as familiar with. They thought all of those things could have depressed the harvest beyond what's normal. So they suggested, you know, with this year being a bait first year coming up, a uh, little more experience with the zones, they feel that the harvest is likely to return to a more normal success rate. So they just said, hold the course. Um, but 
stay tuned into that particular area of the greatest change. Absolutely. I think everything you made makes sense. I think it was reflected in our committee discussion and, and yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye on it. Thanks for your hard work in this area. And, and you did succeed in drawing more attention to those egg damage areas in Southern Sawyer, Rusk and adjacent uh, counties to the West. Yeah, so far so good. Yep. Okay, let's go back to Kaz. Kaz, you got your audio fixed? I hope so. Okay. All right. So um, just to wrap up on the, uh, including in the metric, for any of our large carnivals, I think we should have um, a metric on there with the impact on other species when we're dealing with the large carnivore. And that, I think that's an important metric to include. Um, and then second, I think people have trouble understanding this system of we set a population objective, you know, we're used to looking at numbers and once that objective is set by those metrics that you're looking at, um, the quota then is to uh, move that population in the direction of your ob objective. Is that correct, Randy? Yep. Okay. Um, so I think people mix up quotas and tags and tags are just based on the success rate that it takes to hit that quota. Um, so is Keith Warnke available at this point? Keith, are you on the call, please? Keith, present. Good morning. Uh, Keith is not available today, but I am here in his place. Tammy okay. Ryan, uh, Deputy Division Administrator for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. I think Kaz has a question. Go ahead. Okay. So I was going through this green sheet, and I, too, was looking for some of the numbers from last year. So I went back and pulled the old green sheet um, from 2001, and in the very first paragraph, it states quote, quotas and were adjusted based on tribal harvest declarations. Now that, that's something that the board tried to do on the wolf quotas um, and we were called out of bounds and cooking the books. But then I look at this green sheet and this green sheet never mentions anything about the tribal declarations. So this quota that we're going to pass today, is it subject then to tribal declarations of 50% of this quota? Good question. That is a, a good question. And I, I think that my understanding is that it, there is a tribal declaration process for bear, but I don't know the specifics or um, I think I probably would prefer to um, get our legal counsel in on this in this discussion. Um, Cheryl, if you could help contribute. Uh, this is Cheryl Heilman. Um, and my preference actually would be to do just a tiny bit of research before I responded, because I don't know the answer to that question. So yeah. I think last year, the three, the sheet that was given us, Cheryl, and this secretary was that that was already taken into account. So I think based on the fact that this number that we're being presented today, it's unsure whether it's taken into account or not, which is always the debated point. I think we, I think it'd be appropriate to table this until February. Does that make any difference, Randy, as far as the logistics of having a bear hunt? Uh, it does actually. Um, we, it's in the administrative code that uh, the drawing needs to take place and postcards need to be sent out by February 15th. <clears throat> So we have a, a problem here. Terry? Isn't that Terry? Yeah, my recommendation would be that we incorporate the language in the motion to reflect that this is exclusive of uh, tribal allocation. Well, we've been down this road before, folks. Cheryl? I would prefer it if we could take a five minute break uh, or or consider this, you know, offline and come back and give you the the information that you're asking. 
I okay. see Eric Loebner, he might actually know the answer. So if we could confer um, and then get back to you, I think that would be appropriate. All right, we're not gonna table it. We're just gonna kind of set it off to the side for a bit here. If I could, I just received a text from Eric Lobner, and perhaps he could also um, go on camera here, but he uh, texted that 30 to 40 bear are harvested by tribes annually. So um, that's at least a, a statistic that we're aware of. Yeah, and, and I, can, I can build on that too. Eric's exactly right. Historically, the off-reservation harvest by tribal members in the ceded territory is between 30, 40, 30 and 40 bears a year. That is regulated through Glyphwick. We have a Glyphwick rep on our committee who reports that data back to us and, and participates in our committee discussions. Um, so for perspective, that's 1% of, about 1% of the state's harvest. And so biologically speaking, you know, it, it's a negligible <clears throat> um, impact. And therefore, you know, I don't think the, at least in my time here, the quotas have been adjusted in response to that. Uh, it's just well, Randy, you, that Randy in all due respect, I think you can, you can appreciate the question really isn't what do they actually harvest out of that amount? The question is what is available to the tribes to do that? In the wolf case, they don't harvest any wolves. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I mean, what we're trying to say here is we're approving a quota for hunting black bear in Wisconsin. And I think it's a legitimate question. Is the number that's good that we're approving today go out to all the hunters in Wisconsin? Or is there a chance this department will come back in two weeks or a week and say, we've taken off this many table for allocation from the tribe of treaty rights? And if that's the question that we need to have answered, we can table this for a couple, a little bit. Terry. Yeah, well, let's do that. And I have a couple other questions for Randy. You want to ask us when you come back on the, off the table? Not really on the oh, table. Well, no, no, Randy looks like he's just ready for me. So I think we should hey, just... go ahead, Terry. Okay, thank you. Um, Randy, one of the things we talked about, and Casey, as she's on, available on the call too, uh, as being a Northern representative, um, many of the members of the board are, can recall us getting some substantial complaints from property, pri private property owners of... Uh, dogs and bears running filter skilter through their own property. And does the bear committee and our management plan plan on addressing that? And, you know, how do we deal with it? Because that's a significant issue, especially in Northern Wisconsin. Yeah, absolutely. It is a significant issue. It was talked about briefly, uh, not in great detail, but briefly, uh, during our bear committee discussion, <clears throat> you know, obviously all across the north, uh, but in particular, we did, I, I've personally heard from several landowners in uh, zone D, uh, the area that Bill was talking about, that uh, D has moved south, uh, which now allows uh, an additional area there to allow uh, the use of dogs that hasn't uh, historically, and it's pr predominantly private land. So yes, that is identified as an issue. Um, it's identified in our bear management plan to, to address uh, one of the specifics that's identified is to try to create a database that better tracks these types of reports. Because as we're seeing here, it's largely anecdotal um, and it's largely through word of mouth. And we wanted to try to create a way to better track that information, look for where these incidences might be occurring, what are the trends, uh, and try to put some information to it. I appreciate that. Uh, and I, I trust Casey's on that part too. Hi, okay. Terry. We're going to set this aside for a second and come back to it. I'm not going to tail it, just going to set it aside. Um, next one's land acquisition, Tiffany Wildlife Area, Pepin County, Jim Lemke, real estate section chief. Uh, by the way, when the, when the secretary, when you're ready to bring the bear back off on the agenda, please advise us and we'll do so. Okay. Yes, good morning, Chair Prane. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we got you, Jim. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, Chair Prane again, and Secretary Cole and members of the board. My name is Jim Lemke. I'm the Real Estate Section Chief. Uh, this morning, for your consideration, I have the acquisition 4K, an 85-acre parcel in front of you, all within the project boundary of the Tiffany Wildlife Area in Pepin County. Uh, the land is being purchased from the Potter family, who has for the last many years, since 1940, actually been acquiring lands in hopes of being able to sell that sometime to the state for public use. The land aligns well with existing state ownership to the south and to the east of the property and also blocks in 1,700, 1700 feet of shoreline on the Chippewa River. 
Uh, the property will be open to all five MBOs, MBOAs, and is consistent with the Chippewa River. Uh, primitive camping is allowed in many parts of the Chippewa River, and this property be also allowable use for that. So that's kind of an interesting fact. It turned out this has been a very popular acquisition uh, as evidenced by various letters of support I have received and from different constituents and as evidenced uh, financially. The cost of the acquisition per appraisal is $170,000. Uh, $2,500 of that is being donated by Ducks Unlimited. Thank you. Uh, the Lower Chippewa River Alliance will also donate $500. Uh, $85,000 will be financed through a North American Wetland Grant, a NACA grant. And the remaining $82,000 will be funded by department stewardship funds. Uh, due to the high degree of wetlands on the property, management plans will mostly be passive. However, some invasive species control will occur along with management of existing timber opportunities. Uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I respectfully ask for the board's approval for on 4K for 85 acres located in the Tiffany Wildlife Area and would be happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Is there a motion? Motion, Terry? No. Yes. Terry's got, a, Terry's got a question for us, I guess. No, nope, nope, it's a motion. Motion, is there a second? Bill Bruin, second. Now debate. Terry. I do want to report to the board that uh, Jim did provide me with the appraisal of the property. We did review the appraisal. And uh, we also uh, had some input from our new appraisal review person on the board. So there's several layers that go through here to make sure that we're on task in representing the uh, taxpayers of Wisconsin. So uh, they did a pretty good job on this appraisal. So I support it obviously with making the motion. Thank you. Any other questions for Jim? All in favor say aye. 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 Polls? Motion carries. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, sir. Next item is uh, informational items. Update on the wolf management plan and wolf monitoring efforts. Randy Johnson, large carnivore specialist. We had one written comment on this. There's no testimony. Randy, the floor is yours. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me just shuffle my papers here real quick if I can. So, yeah, good, uh, good morning. Still morning. Uh, Chair Preen, Secretary Cole, members of the board. Uh, I am back to give an update on uh, our wolf management plan efforts, as well as wolf monitoring. So on the screen uh, is a timeline of events uh, that reviews the last year, uh, as well as the next few months ahead. Uh, this is important because wolf delisting occurred uh, one year ago, uh, January 4th, 2021. And shortly thereafter, the department began efforts to update the wolf plan at that time. <clears throat> Uh, one of the first things the department did was create a wolf management plan committee. Uh, the purpose of this committee is to provide input specifically towards the development of the updated wolf plan. Uh, the committee was intentionally diverse and we strived to represent the broad spectrum of interest areas uh, across wolf management while maintaining fairness and balance uh, the best we could. <clears throat> we created this committee through a two-step process uh, first, invitations to participate were sent to government agency uh, and tribal partners. And at the same time, uh, we created an application process uh, for stakeholder seats. Uh, these stakeholder seats were grouped uh, broadly into hunting and trapping organizations, wolf advocacy and education organizations, uh, and then agriculture and ranching organizations. Each of these categories had up to six seats available. Uh, and we announced this process on our website, we did a press release, uh, and we saw a pretty good response uh, through this application process. Uh, because of the invitations and applications, we did not know what the final makeup of this committee would be until the completion of the process. Uh, once it was completed, we, we ended up with a committee of 29 different groups uh, mm -hmm. representing uh, a variety of interest areas uh, across wolf management. Uh, in addition to those on the committee, we had a number of DNR staff specialists uh, serve in a support role uh, through the committee's process to provide expertise and answer questions uh, for the group as needed. Uh, during uh, the same time frame, uh, last spring, April and May 2021, the department developed and launched a public input tool on the website. Uh, and this tool, importantly, was not designed to be a scientific survey 
uh, but rather it is a tool that was designed to allow broad public input uh, from anybody with an interest in wolf management. Uh, the input was used to identify important topics related to wolf management and the wet management plan uh, and identify commonalities and differences uh, among the opinions of respondents. Uh, that information was compiled into a summary. Uh, it's available on the website. Uh, and I believe we did present it to our, our wolf plan committee uh, at the first meeting as well. Uh, transitioning into the summer and fall of 2021, the Wolf Plan Committee met for a series of four meetings. Each of these meetings was six hours long. They were held virtually and led by a professional facilitator. Uh, the committee was also sent pre-work assignments to be completed uh, prior to and in between these meetings. Uh, and this allowed additional input uh, and it allowed every single group the opportunity to provide this input uh, in a in a fashion that, you know, as we all know, with a group of 29, it may be hard to uh, get everything communicated in a, in a live meeting. So we felt that this was an extra opportunity and it allowed for fair and balanced input. <clears throat> and I just want to take a second to commend this group for the tremendous amount of work and effort they put in in a relatively short time frame, uh, a few months over the summer and fall. We all know how busy that time is. And so I want to commend the group for their work. Uh, the output from this effort is a final report from the plan committee that describes the process uh, as well as containing all of the input and discussions that the group held on a variety of topics. Uh, the draft of this report was recently completed, uh, shared with the committee for their feedback. Uh, we received that feedback and we expect to have this report finalized in a matter of days. Uh, we'll of course post, post that to the website uh, and I can certainly share it with board members. Uh, just let me know. <clears throat> uh, while the report has been compiled uh, over the last couple of months, myself and other DNR staff have been working hard drafting uh, various sections of the updated management plan. Um, our focus to date has been on the scientific and historical portions of the plan uh, until we get this uh, input report finalized, uh, which we'll then use to inform uh, our discussion uh, in the policy portion of the plan. Uh, as identified on the timeline, our goal remains to have a first draft of the complete uh, updated management plan available for public review uh, next month, February. Uh, we'll initiate a public review process, uh, take obviously public feedback uh, on the plan itself, uh, consider and incorporate that feedback and hope to bring, uh, if you can click please, the timeline identifies June, uh, but we're, we're striving, doing the best we can to bring it to the board sooner than that, uh, potentially as soon as April or, or May. Again, to bring the final updated plan uh, following public review to the board. Next slide, please. So a little more about what's, again, going into this plan. There's a number of sources uh, of input and consideration that are feeding into the final document. Um, as you may be aware, uh, during the last delisting, 2012, 13, and 14, uh, at the time, a previous DNR Wolf Advisory Committee uh, met numerous times over the course of a couple of years to develop a new wolf plan. Uh, that effort resulted in a draft wolf plan uh, that ultimately did not cross the finish line. Uh, however, it has a lot of good information in it, and we've Throughout this process, we've tried to utilize that 2015 draft plan uh, as a non-binding reference point. We wanna take advantage of that work, uh, but we also recognize that it's, it's already eight years old. And so we've uh, tried to infuse uh, the new plan with as much as possible from that, that plan. Uh, we've also used that 2015 draft to help guide discussions and take uh, specific feedback from our committee. The other things at play, of course, are the, the committee's input uh, in the report, uh, the public input that we've collected uh, earlier this year, as well as going forward in the review process. Uh, of course, best available wildlife science, uh, infusing the plan with that, uh, social science, uh, all of this being guided, of course, by current state law. And just a, a quick note, uh, you know, it's a graphic here. These, these circles do not represent uh, the importance of each of these items uh, they're, they're all important uh, and they'll all factor in uh, in various ways into the final plan. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So 
So uh, in this slide, I wanted to provide uh, more information on what's going into the plan and what the structure of this document will look like. <clears throat> and so uh, there'll be an introduction section, of course, uh, describing the development of the plan, uh, executive summary, those types of things. And then uh, four sections. Uh, the first section is titled Gray Wolf Ecology and Population Dynamics. And this section uh, is, provides a scientific species overview, uh, including the biology and ecology of the species across its range. Section two uh, is focused more on the human side of wolf management. Now it's titled Human Dimensions and Cultural Significance. Uh, and it has three main components within this section. Uh, first, the department's social science team uh, earlier in 2021 completed a literature review of the recent scientific literature uh, related to human dimensions and wolf management. Uh, they wrote a summary of, of those findings and that is provided uh, in the plan along with uh, all of the references to the studies that they reviewed. Uh, the second component in this part is a review of the 2014 scientific survey of public attitudes towards wolves uh, completed here in Wisconsin. <clears throat> uh, and then the third part is uh, something that has been included in other species plans, but uh, an expanded effort in this plan. Uh, and that is that we've invited contributions from all 11 tribes in the state uh, to uh, write up and uh, contribute a section focused on the tribal perspectives and cultural significance uh, with respect to wolves uh, and, and their uh, tribe. And importantly, we, we were very clear in our request here that this is not a location for policy or recommendations. Uh, we've, we've received that through our committee process and in other conversations. Uh, this section is, is more focused to uh, intend, intended to provide context and educational piece related to, uh, again, the tribal uh, perspective, uh, because it's a very important human dimensions component of wolf management uh, in Wisconsin and elsewhere. Uh, section three is titled Gray Wolves in Wisconsin. And this is focused on essentially the story of wolves in the state. Uh, it provides the history of wolves and wolf management, including population monitoring, reviewing population management, uh, human wolf conflict, public education and outreach uh, and more. Uh, and then finally, section four, uh, this is titled Gray Wolf Management, Conservation and Stewardship, uh, a plan for the future. This is the policy portion of the plan. Uh, it will contain a series of objectives, strategies and products uh, intended to guide wolf management over the next year. And this is uh, where the input and science uh, discussed in the previous couple slides will be used to help guide uh, the development of this section uh, by the department uh, in an effort to reflect the spectrum of input uh, and objectives that we've heard discussed uh, so far. Uh, so for example, uh, through the Wolf Plan Committee process, uh, I wanted to provide a few highlights of the information and, and topics that they provided us. Uh, through the committee process, we asked each group uh, to provide the top five issues and concerns that they wanted to see uh, addressed uh, through this plan. From that, we had, we've developed a list of 138 items. Uh, each group had multiple opportunities to clarify, add or subtract to their own items, um, as well as add specific action items uh, to, these, uh, to this list. Uh, we then ran through, we, we grouped these 138 items into uh, broad topic areas. Uh, those are called nutshells. And then we ran through a simple exercise among the committee to gauge the level of support uh, among the committee for each of the items. Uh, through that process, we saw some of the top items uh, to address included things like uh, pursuing options to minimize human wolf conflicts, uh, including the overall ecosystem health and sustainability of the wolf population uh, in the plan uh, and supporting state-based management of wolves, uh, including regulated hunting and trapping. Now, again, those are broad topic statements. There's a lot of information within each of those statements, but all of that is captured in the plan or in the, uh, the report, excuse me. And it's very transparent as to who, who provided what input uh, and how the committee uh, gauged their own level of support for each of those topics. So in addition to this effort provided by the organizations, 
Uh, we also had specific items that we uh, requested feedback on specifically. Uh, these included things like research needs. Uh, from the 2015 draft, uh, that committee had developed a whole list of research topics. Uh, and we presented that back to the committee and took feedback on the list, as well as suggestions for, for additions. Um, through that process, we heard a clear desire uh, to conduct another uh, social science survey in the state. Uh, a desire for more research into the impacts of regulated harvest on the wolf population. Uh, and for more evaluation and refinement of our wolf uh, monitoring program and methodology. Uh, a couple more, zone boundaries. We reviewed zone boundaries, the objectives and purposes behind them and took feedback on any desired changes. Uh, we had a very important discussion on population management frameworks. This is one of the items that was uh, unresolved in the 2015 draft. Uh, in that document, they presented three, three options. Those options were a numeric uh, population objective, a numeric range objective, or moving towards more of an outcomes-based objective focused on desirable outcomes. Uh, we presented this information, had a discussion on the benefits and drawbacks of each of these, uh, and we held a round robin discussion. Each group had three minutes to uh, provide us their preference of these uh, and the reasons for that preference. Uh, finally, another important one, the future DNR Wolf Advisory Committee. Uh, as, we, as you know, we've had uh, two separate committees over the past year. Uh, once the plan is adopted, we look forward to having a single Wolf Advisory Committee structure again. Uh, and, th and this structure uh, will be identified in the plan. And we had a discussion on this. Uh, this group had 29 organizations that have been involved in a lot of different natural resources work and committees, and we wanted their feedback on how best to bring together a, a wolf committee that is balanced and represents uh, the views of all stakeholders. Again, we look to uh, identify this in the plan. <clears throat> um, so with that, I know I covered a lot of ground, but that uh, is a, a quick review of where we're at in this process. Um, again, so far to date, section one, two, and three has received most of our attention. Once we get the input, we'll start to focus on the, the policy portions of the plan uh, very, very soon. Okay, uh, next slide here, thank you. And, and this is pivoting now to part two of the update. This is on wolf monitoring. Uh, so as you know, each winter since 1979, the department has conducted wolf monitoring efforts. Uh, these primarily consist of snow tracking surveys uh, these surveys are essentially going out with fresh snow conditions uh, to drive, to snowmobile, to hike, to snowshoe uh, the roads and trails uh, within assigned blocks across the state and look for wolf tracks. Uh, if wolf tracks are found, the location is recorded and the tracks are followed to uh, determine the number of wolves present uh, at that location. Um, we've currently got a number of DNR staff participating across the state. We have USDA biologists. We have a handful of tribal biologists that participate. Um, and then in, in addition to that, we have a core of, of certified volunteer trackers. Uh, these are citizen scientist volunteers that go through department-sponsored uh, tracking and training in tracking methods and survey methodology. And they're a, a vital component to helping us collect all this data. The map on the right shows all the tracking blocks across the state, uh, and, and our goal is basically to conduct three surveys within each of these blocks that has a evidence of recent wolf activity. So to give you an idea what this looks like, last year we completed 375 surveys across the state, uh, and that included over 12,000 linear miles of, of snow track survey effort. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, to wrap this up, uh, in addition to the, the data collected through those tracking surveys, we maintain a number of radio collared wolves across the state, uh, and that gives us important information on wolf movement uh, and, and territory sizes. Um, the data collected through the, the collars, as well as the snow tracking surveys, uh, is all used to inform the occupancy model used by the state to estimate the state's wolf uh, population abundance. And I want to bring attention to, on the top right there, this uh, methodology uh, was developed between the DNR research science team uh, and UW-Madison, and it was recently published in the Journal of Wildlife Management. 
Uh, the Journal of Wildlife Management is a, a, a very highly respected and peer-reviewed journal of wildlife science. Um, so it was really great recognition and, and great to see uh, our methodology uh, developed here, published uh, in, in the journal. Uh, to wrap it up, the data analysis uh, will be completed this spring uh, following the conclusion of our, our snow tracking surveys. Uh, and we expect to have an updated wolf uh, population abundance estimate uh, by summer 2022. Uh, next slide, that, that is everything I have and I can certainly take questions. Yeah. You're muted. I am muted? Doc is. Oh, Doc, you're muted. Excellent update, Randy. Thank you for that uh, report. Are there any questions from board members from Randy, Bill Bruins, and then Terry? Yeah, um, so you're doing your usual work with uh, tracking and, and coming up with an estimated population goal. How are you going to use that number uh, in your final wolf management plan? That's a good question. You know, I mean, that will give us an idea of where we're at currently as far as a population estimate. That's something we've done, as I mentioned, since 1979. So uh, it's largely informational. Um, I, I don't necessarily see that guiding the plans policy development, um, you know, because by the time we have this estimate, it'll be next summer. Um, so hopefully we'll have a plan uh, completed and approved by then. Um, so I, I'm not sure if that's a very satisfactory answer, but yeah, I'm, so what that, I mean, it seems like you, in your presentation, <coughs> talking about uh, a projected population goal like the plague. So, so can we safely assume that, that your wolf management plan will not include uh, a population goal for the state? It's a tough one to answer at this point. Um, as I mentioned, we had a lot of discussion on that. There's a lot of groups that voiced support for having a number. They wanted a target number. Uh, there's a lot of other groups that uh, wanted to see something different, more of an outcomes-based objective. Uh, and we had a lot of groups that also talked about, you know, can we blend those two together? Uh, and focus on, you know, having measurable targets, but also uh, focusing the discussion on desirable outcomes rather than a specific number. And so that's the discussion that we're going to use in the weeks ahead to develop uh, essentially what that objective might look like. So at this point, I don't have a good answer, um, but I can tell you it's obviously a, a big point of discussion among that committee, and there's a lot of different viewpoints on it. You think so? <laughs> Anybody else? Terry, then Kaz. Uh, thanks, Randy. Um, I, I think that would be extremely important. And as you and I talked yesterday, uh, either a number or a range would, uh, would be very important, I think, to our board, that uh, we know what we're dealing with and what uh, the overall objective of the state of Wisconsin is on wolf management. And unless you have a number or a range, uh, you're kind of shooting in the dark. Yes. Okay. I, I'm sensing the fact that uh, we're trying to move the wolf population goal similar to what we do for deer and bear, which is you have a population objective, you read your metrics, and move the population in the direction the metrics are telling it. Is that kind of what's behind the scenes holding up this number? That was part of the discussion, yes. That would be what we were calling outcomes-based objectives. And again, a number of groups on the committee were supportive of that. But I think also across the committee, there was a desire for measurable targets uh, and, and not just completely abandoning specific numbers. So. Moving in a general direction, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Well, um, and, and, uh, I believe it's 
numbers anyways. So, um, so really what I call it management by pain. And if we're feeling the pain, um, we need to move the population in the downward direction until pain is alleviated. Um, so I really think that's a, a good way to do it than trying to come up with a number based on a model or something like that. Um, but I understand your dilemma. And then my other question, would the feds um, be willing to go along with that kind of management without an actual number? Your video was a little choppy, but I think I got I think I got it. Um, the first part was about conflict and, and managing the population in response to conflict. And it's a good point that, you know, obviously the, the number of wolves on the landscape has an impact there, but, you know, a, a big portion of this plan will still be dedication to uh, an integrated wolf conflict program and continuing to develop and deploy the different tools to try to address those conflicts as they're occurring. Uh, I think that's an important, important point. Uh, the second question about will the feds go along with with uh, can you clarify what you mean? Well, uh, not having a specific number as our target oh. and as our population. I, I don't know if they're willing to accept a numberless <laughs> objective. Yeah, I think and I, I hate to speak for the feds, but, you know, we we have a federal post delisting monitoring criteria that's implemented following delisting from the ESA. <clears throat> and that is focused on, you know, managing threats, those types of things. Uh, so with respect to that, you know, I, I think we'll obviously have to maintain the criteria to, uh, I think it's 250 right now is federal uh, delisting criteria. I think we have state criteria of 350 uh, or 300. I, I forget the exact, exact numbers off the top of my head, but I would definitely see those being included uh, to maintain that status. Uh, whether they'll quote unquote go along with uh, not having a number, I, I think so. I think their focus is on making sure that the population remains healthy and that we can respond to and identify threats. Um, defining what a healthy population is is a very difficult thing to do, um, but I think you can kind of see it or, or, or know when you see it, uh, especially if the population were to get to a low number or the trends uh, were indicating a dropping population. And then one last thing, um, as was brought up, the bear um, population, have, was there any consideration or is there any metric that we're forming on um, predation on other wildlife species? And how it's impacting yes, them? Because yes. I think that's Cass, can you try? Can you try? Can you try stopping your video a second? See if your audio. You're breaking up with audio, so try minimizing your video and just talk if you could. Minimize my video. Just in the very bottom, yeah. And I just try talking once. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's much better. Go ahead. Ah, okay. Um, Overload so, down there in, in Waukesha, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the. Uh, other metric that I would like to see included on this, and I know what the sportsmen out there would, is, is that we're taking into account the predation on other species as part of setting those population objectives. So was there any talk of that through those committees? Uh, yeah, absolutely. That was it, actually, I think that was a louder theme through our public input process last, uh, last spring. Uh, focusing on the impacts of, of wolves on deer and elk populations, that was a, a high priority among the folks that, that uh, responded to that uh, input tool. It was discussed as well through uh, our Wolf Management Plan Committee, um, but I think more of the discussion there was focused on livestock conflict and, and, and hunting dog and pet conflict, but it's absolutely part of the discussion, yes. Okay, and is it going to be one of the metrics we consider when we're setting the objective? I can't answer that. We're not oh. there yet. That'll be, you know, development in the weeks ahead, but I, I can guarantee it'll get attention through those discussions. All right. 
All right. Thank you. Kaz, bring your video back up, but if you if you start disintegrating, we're going to have you minimize it again, please. And, okay. Uh, good. Any other questions? If not, we're going to move on to back to Jay on the bear quota. Everybody okay with that? All right, moving back to bear quota. Cheryl, please come on. Uh, 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 good afternoon. Thank you for uh, giving me a moment just to verify my answer because I know it's something that's important to the board. Um, the the quota numbers that are on the green sheet for bear are for state uh, licensed uh, bear harvest. So there will be no uh, subtraction of these numbers or uh, further discussion with the tribes with respect to these quota numbers that you have on your green sheet. All right, thank you. So let the record show that. Um, would you have be opposed then for us to put the wording that we had last year on the green sheet as an amendment to the motion or do you think it's necessary? Um, I think with my clarification, it's not necessary. Okay, is there a motion then to, to, uh, to approve the 2022 bear harvest quotas as presented? Terry, so move, second? Second. Second, any discussion? Kaz is a good point you brought up. I'm glad it was clarified. Um, All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Um, what's the perfect board? We've got, we're at, uh, we could do the deer uh, or take a 15, 20 minute break now for something to eat and, or and come back and hammer it out. What's, what's the purview of the board? Any suggestions? I don't think we if we keep we if we go through the whole rest of the agenda, we probably have an hour, I imagine. You want to take a quick break? Come back. No, let's take a let's take a break and then come back. All right, let's take 15 minutes enough, everybody. Bill, can you yeah, well I go along with 20? All right, 1215. The board will reconvene at 1215 to finish the meeting. Everybody, please mute your video. I mean, please mute your audio at least. Last time a lot of audios were going, you hear a lot of chit chatter. So please mute your audio during the break. Thank you.
Start calling Terry the sun drop kid. Bill, that's one of my uh, vices to get a little caffeine in me so I uh, try to diminish my headaches because I'm not a coffee drinker. I've never been a coffee drinker. Well, the, the reason I use the phrase sun drop kid, uh, I had a cousin who was a Vietnam vet and in Vietnam, they, he got to be known as the sun drop kid because that's all he drank when, when he was in Vietnam. Well, you know, they actually uh, uh, bottle it here in Shawano, Wisconsin. Oh, okay. The Twigs beverage. And so we have sun drop days here even. <laughs> it's a big deal. It's very, very interesting. Now they got a big plant here and uh, it's locally owned and the boys now are involved in it. And it's, it's kind of a neat thing. Very good. Good afternoon, board members. This is Lori. Just to remind you that the, um, the video feed is live at the moment. Well, that's thank you. nice to know, Lori. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Are we back in quorum? Got five of us. Is there more five of us? Sharon Adams around? Hey, are we missing anybody? Everybody there? I only got five on my screen. Terry, Bill, Kaz, Marcy. Anybody else there? Bill Smith? I'm here, yeah. Okay. And Sharon? <clears throat> Waiting on Sharon, looks like. I'm here. You're there. Okay, Sharon. We have a quorum back. Close me back to order, please. Uh, we are down to letter B, report and preliminary results of the 2021 deer season. Kimberly Curry, Sarah Hoy, and also Casey Krieger, and Jeff Pritzel. We got a tag team going on here with this one. Look forward to this every year. Who wants to start it out? Kimberly? Good morning, Chairman Prane, Natural Resources Board members. I guess good afternoon is better. Uh, Secretary Cole, I'm Kimberly Curry. I'm the Bureau Director for Customer and Outreach Services. I'm going to kick us off today, but we will be passing the torch. Uh, Chief Warden Casey Krieger is going to talk about some public safety and enforcement and education items after we talk a little bit about licensing. Sarah Hoy, our Communications Director, will talk about traditional media, social media, and our email campaigns. And we'll wrap up our presentation with Jeff Pritz 
Council, the Wildlife Management Deer Specialist, who will talk about season framework, harvest reports, and CWD surveillance. So with that, let's start with the first slide. Um, last year, we know we had seen a spike of uh, things due to COVID. Everybody was trapped in their homes. Everybody wanted to get outside. We saw an increase in park visitation, recreational vehicles, and it was no different when it came to licensing. So we weren't quite exactly sure what to expect as we went into this season. As you can see from the numbers, uh, Crossbow continued that upward trend. Um, we were close to last year's numbers, but didn't quite make it at 800. 10,919 licenses sold when we compiled this data on January 3rd. Um, it is interesting to note, or at least I found it interesting to note, that our total for 2019 was 794,818. So uh, both crossbow and gun exceeded if we look at 19 as our base. Okay. Uh, again, this year, we had customers from all 50 states and 20 countries, uh, 500 and, or 754,000, over 754,000 uh, licenses were sold to Wisconsin residents, followed by about 18,000 going to Minnesota. Yeah, next slide, Kimberly. No, I'm just going to do it right oh. from here. I just had a couple of extra pieces. Um, uh, eight, six thousand, about seven thousand from Illinois, and eleven hundred from Michigan and Florida. Um, now we can go to the next slide. Uh, the the nine day week continued from a customer contact standpoint to be one of our busiest weeks of the year. Our peak day of the year was the Friday before the gun deer season and a special thanks to the CS staff who rose to the occasion. As you can see, they handled 2,400 calls. 95% uh, of those calls were answered within two minutes and our average speed of answer on that day was 23 seconds. Mm. Uh, continued uh, big uh, heavy volume for the week. And once again, the uh, performance metrics there were outstanding with 95% of the calls in two minutes. Uh, there will, we also handled uh, law enforcement, hotline, tip line calls, and those will be touched upon, I think, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, also interesting to note is that this year, 60.8% of our customers purchased their licenses online, and 32% of our customers, or just a little bit over 32%, continued to make an in-person purchase, whether that was at our agents or at our DNR service counters. The next slide has a little bit more information about our demographics. Um, again, this year, we had a strong participation from new hunters. Um, again, the 2021 numbers were slightly down, but they still continue to exceed the 19, 2019 numbers. So we'll have to see what the long-term trend here is. Uh, interesting to note, we had hunters participate of all ages. We had 476 hunters over the age of 90 participate in this year's hunt. The oldest female who purchased a license was 94 years old, and the oldest male who purchased a license was 100 years old. So mm -hmm. the rich tradition of deer hunting in Wisconsin continues. With that, I'm gonna pass the torch to Chief Warden Casey Krieger to talk a little bit about uh, the, uh, the safety and education. Thanks, hey, Kimberly. Good morning, Chair Dr. Preen. Members of the Natural Resources Board, Secretary, Secretary Cole, Deputy Secretary Sarah Berry, and Assistant Deputy Secretary Stephen Little. My name is Casey Krieger. I'm the Chief Warden for the Division of Public Safety and Resource Protection, uh, located here in the DNR. I have a quick three slides to paint the picture of what our deer season looked uh, like here in 2021 uh, concerning the nine days. So I'll start off with this first slide that uh, hopefully everybody can see in front of you. What this slide uh, depicts is our calls for service, Kimberly had mentioned that just a couple of moments ago, where we gauge and watch our patrol contacts and our calls for service. And what you can see there is our daily count for calls for service. So it just, again, shows the amount of activity out there and the, the interaction with our public is higher um, still that opening weekend. And those calls for service are citizens calling to report or request assistance from our officers out there on the landscape. And the, the, the uh, patrol contacts piece of that is at 12,135 
those are contacts reported in by our officers as they uh, contact our public out there. Just for uh, kind of reference, uh, the patrol contacts in 2020 were 13,171, and the and uh, the calls for service were 12 1,291. So very similar to last year is what we saw with regards to uh, interacting with the public. So next slide, please. Next slide uh, de depicts our hunter education piece. Obviously of utmost priority for our agency is making sure that folks are safe out there in the landscape while they're recreating in our great outdoors. So I'm happy to report, uh, albeit one accident is one too many for us, but with the amount of uh, potential hunters on the landscape being 565 some thousand, uh, to come in and have six incidents uh, within those nine days is pretty tremendous. So a shout out to uh, staff within wildlife program, within law enforcement, the Office of Communications, everybody coming together to pull that one across the finish line, getting and reminding folks to be safe out there on the landscape. Um, one thing I thought I'd mention is um, of all, I think five of those incidents were all self-inflicted um, that come down to gun handling skills. So that'll be something our program will be focusing on going forward so we can move the needle in that area as well. And we did a lot of public outreach this year again uh, with the help of Sarah Hoye and the Office of Communications by radio, podcast, Facebook, all the social media platforms that we could get out and remind people to uh, follow those rules of firearm safety to be safe out there. Uh, next slide. Um, this slide, what I wanted to touch on is it's of great importance and that's be our future um, with hunter recruitment, retention and reactivation. And uh, what we did is we pulled together the numbers on past years on what that looked like as far as mentored hunting and license sales. So as you peruse that, you'll see that we're down 5% um, from 2020, um, not highly unexpected. I think as Kimberly alluded to, we were all kind of wondering what this year was gonna look like with, with the continual wave of COVID. So we'll be tracking that, looking at trends, talking with folks, take, giving surveys to determine um, and make sure we're headed in the right direction with raising the amount of mentored and hunting licenses out there on the landscape. With regards to learn to hunts, um, our staff did an excellent job providing venues and safe places to hold some of those. And I'm happy to report that we were able, even during the COVID pandemic, uh, we were able to pull off eight of those learn to deer hunt events, um, which included almost 35 participants. Um, we also had another 23 learn to hunt programs uh, that we held for deer, pheasant, waterfall, bear, and turkey that uh, had a correlation of another 228 participants, excuse me. And then we continued on with our program for hunt for food. Uh, and we had close to 25 participants in those classes as well. And we continued uh, partnerships with Dane County, um, getting folks introduced to gun deer hunting out on their ranges, uh, providing safe gun handling skills. And we also piloted two range outreach days um, at our ranges across the state uh, owned by the Department of Natural Resources. So another neat thing I thought I'd just throw out there is uh, we have an archery equipment loaner program to get folks really involved in picking up the sport of archery. And uh, of the 75 bows that we have at our disposal to loan out to folks to stick their toe in the water with archery, I'm happy to report 69 of those were loaned out this last year. So moving the metric on getting folks introduced to our archery sport out there. Um, and then finally, I just would like to wrap up that I'm happy to report that we have a new uh, R3 supervisor uh, in the section, and that being Bob Knack. I know Bob's very familiar to all of you. And we're really excited about having uh, a new point of light in that program and seeing uh, what Bob brings to us and moving that R3 program forward. So, and uh, obviously we wait with bated breath uh, waiting for COVID to kind of step out of the way so we can get moving um, that needle. So with that, I will turn it over to Sarah at the Office of Communications. Thank you, Casey. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Hoyt. I'm the Communications Director for the Wisconsin DNR. So now we're going to take a look at how we communicated with the public during the deer season and take a look at what some of those results were. So in short, we increased the number of news releases that were sent and the number of media briefings that were held. So we distributed 45 news releases for deer season plus CWD 
and held four media briefings. We completed 188 media interviews. That's what the staff did. That was relating to deer season plus CWD. Our news coverage reached more than 6.78 billion people. That is a 900% increase from 2020. Now, when it comes to billions, that's not individual people, rather that's the total views of all the stories combined. And with that news coverage, broadcast and online stories were in 23 countries outside the US plus 45 states that included Washington, DC. We had coverage within Wisconsin reached more than 3 billion people. Some of the national outlets where we were picked up in included the Associated Press, the Oprah Winfrey Network, CBS Sports, Discovery Channel, CNN, and more. We were also mentioned on 2,000 blog and forum posts. Next slide, please. If you looked at our social media, at a glance, it would appear that the 2021 season was the worst ever. But something to keep in mind is that people are more likely to complain when they haven't had a successful year versus talking about how great it was. Next slide, please. So despite some folks having unsuccessful seasons, we heard from just as many people that it was the best season ever. Some of that is noted here. These are comments from our Facebook pages. Go ahead to the next side piece. There's more information here. You have people talking about how their daughter shot her first at 7 a.m. Uh, best season in years. Great. My brother from Texas got to come up and experience this. So it's always interesting. You have to take a step back and look at all of those comments, commentary, the direct messages in total, and really get that balance of coverage and communication that we're hearing from the public. Next slide, please. When it comes to social media and deer season, during the entire season, that's August through December, we had 156 pieces of content published across our DNR social platforms with over 7.5 million impressions. We had nearly 60,000 clicks to the website for deer related resources. We hosted four Q&A sessions on Facebook and Instagram that reached about 148,000 unique people. Two events were specifically targeted early in the season to help those interested in learning to hunt. Between November 1st and the 28th, the social media team, which is three people, received, triaged, and responded to 15,000 comments and direct messages. In the 10 days leading up to the start of the season, we received an average of 900 comments and direct messages per day, many of which we respond to because we do treat that as customer service. We like to respond and provide that service excellence to the public. Next slide, please. When it comes to email campaigns in the deer season, we had several messages, including thanks for purchasing messages. That was open 260,000 times. That means they received an email 260,000 times that was opened. We had about 21,000 clicks from those that went to the website. We had learned to hunt and other hunt for food participant messages open 656 times. And we also had some first time buyer messages open 338,000 times with nearly 21,000 clicks to the website. Next slide, please. For hunter safety, our paid campaign, our goal was to increase awareness and promote hunter safety, specifically tab K and tree stand safety among current hunters statewide with an emphasis in the counties with the highest license sales. We had over 13 million impressions in two weeks across all tactics that included Facebook, digital billboards, radio, newspaper, online display ads, and streaming audio. Facebook drove more than 4,000 clicks to the website. Next slide, please. For our recruitment, retention, and reactivation, known in-house as R3, we also had a paid campaign. Our goal was to recruit people of color, women, and millennials to consider hunting this season, to encourage legacy hunters to head out, and to educate all hunters on the venison donation program. Through this campaign, we had over 7 million impressions during roughly about 10 days, and that included Facebook, Instagram, streaming audio, billboards, et cetera. We targeted statewide, but we saw the highest engagement in legacy hunters in Western Wisconsin, Madison, Green Bay, and the Fox Cities. All told, while this is a coordinated effort uh, with programs outside of the OC, my direct team is small but mighty. We took on a heavy load, and I think you can see that that work is paying off. So big thank you and a hats off to them. Does anybody have any questions for me before I pass it on to Jeff Pritz? Any questions for Sarah? Okay. We'll be back uh, next, Jeffrey. 
A good afternoon, uh, Chair Brain and members of the board and Secretary Cole and members of the Secretary's staff. A um, few slides here just to set the stage um, as a reminder for the 2021 deer season, we had no deer management units that were in buck only status. We had 36 counties uh, or deer management units that participated in the holiday hunt this year. And 27 of those counties also had an extension of the archery season, which continues now through the end of January. Uh, the six green counties represent those that did participate in the holiday hunt, um, but did not opt for the January extension. In both cases, um, the participation in the holiday hunt and the extension were the most deer management units um, that we've seen um, participate in that. So next slide. So this graph represents the buck registration day by day throughout the season. And we see it grow and accumulate through the uh, early archery season and uh, grow faster as we get to the peak of the archery season. And then it's obvious where the nine day firearm season plays out. And this just demonstrates that um, there's a certain amount of predictability, of course, to the buck harvest statewide over time. And, and as we discussed back earlier in the year, uh, during the 21 season setting, uh, the buck harvest statewide has been quite um, stable, you know, under the current deer management program that we have. So we came in just a few percentage points below the five year average, which is the blue line, but uh, pretty consistent buck harvest uh, again this year. Next slide. So this table, a summary of, of this year, just compared to last year, and we do a little bit of comparing one year to another, but in other cases, we compare over a, a longer average. So going right to the bottom um, in the total, this year, the overall harvest um, right now is essentially 10% below where we were last year. Um, what's interesting about that this year is that a big portion of that drop is made up of reduced antlerless harvest in the farmland zones of the state. And the buck harvest is relatively stable. That fluctuation that showed up this year um, really showed up in the antlerless harvest, um, uh, which is interesting. Uh, not it was the opposite last year, and so maybe there's a little bit of um, you know what what goes up must come down perhaps. But there's a number of dynamics uh, that are playing out um, that we'll be exploring further as we go into the the spring um, sessions of, of setting the 2022 season framework. Next slide. This slide we share every year. Um, it's a graph that shows the long-term trending shift of the buck harvest uh, from the firearm season uh, to the archery and crossbow seasons. And um, again, that's happened. You know, it shows how that, that started quite some time ago. What's interesting to note here is if you look at just the last three years, um, it's been relatively stable. Um, now that that doesn't necessarily indicate that things are going to level out. We'll have to keep watching that in the future. And again, this also doesn't represent numbers. This represents percentages. And so, um, but that that percentage has been pretty stable the last couple of years. Which again, is interesting to know. Next slide. So this is just a statewide look at our four deer management zones. Um, this year's harvest relative to the five-year average. Of, of note here, um, the only harvest that came in above the five-year average was the buck harvest of the central farmland. Uh, the antlerless harvest in both of our forest zones was pretty much right on the five-year average. And the uh, again, as said earlier, the antlerless harvest in the farmland zones um, it was a fair bit below the five-year average, which was kind of the uh, interesting point this year. Uh, next slide. Talking about our CWD surveillance efforts, um, the focus this year was in the remaining counties of the Northeast District that were working to get their, their surveillance totals up for the two-year focus um, periods that have been rotating through the state. And then the blue areas represent the, the portion of the state where we're sampling annually as part of the endemic zone and um, spots and clusters in other parts of the state. Um, we are, um, our number of kiosk sampling opportunities for the hunters was pretty similar to last year. Um, the, the note this year is the expansion of the dumpster program, which is really getting a lot of uh, positive feedback, um, grew somewhat again this year. 
and anticipate that to continue to grow um, going forward. We get a lot of good feedback about the expansion of that dumpster program. Next slide. We're, um, our numbers are up a little bit more from this now. We're closer to 16,500 samples that have come in. Um, that, as is the harvest numbers, that's down from the past couple of years where we were closer to 19,000 samples coming in. Um, again, mentioning uh, the, the kiosks and the dumpsters, uh, thanks to those folks out there that um, did adopt uh, a number of those kiosks. And a lot of the dumpsters were adopted by local individuals or organizations to help you know, further that program. Um, one of the challenge we had this year um, was that the turnaround time on CWD testing um, as a result of some um, staff shortages that came upon the Wisconsin Vet Diagnost Diagnostics Lab that actually does the sampling uh, created a bit of a bottleneck, unfortunately, this year. And so the, the turnaround time was uh, closer to 20 days um, this year at this point, which is um, above what has been the past. Um, next slide. And finally, just a nod to the Deer Donation Program. I know Sarah mentioned that um, a real important program and a strong program, but has been unfortunately fading a little bit over the years. And that's due in part to uh, more limited access to venison processors uh, that are able to uh, participate in that program. So in response to that, we've seen another grassroots effort um, kind of build up with collaboration with DNR staff and the CDACs to address that in some counties that don't have a local processor for dropping deer off where they established a, um, a drop-off point. And that was done last year uh, in Marquette County, and this year it was expanded, this past year was expanded to Green Lake County as well. And so they, they about doubled the number of deer that were um, contributed in that program, and then they were then shipped over to a, a venison processor. The, the total donation this year of, of over 1,300 deer runs a very similar to where we were at last year. And with that, I think that's the conclusion of our summary. Any questions for the group? Uh, it's been the board. Uh, yeah, thank you. Any questions for the group? Uh, you know, just an oversight that I, I noticed in the last five or six years is actually astronomical, the technology that this department has displayed. I mean, there's a lot of different agencies at Madison, but there's no question that this department leads when it comes to technology, uh, hands down. Uh, Kimberly, your stats and response time is unbelievable. Sarah, the message and the power that the department has and the message that they send out to the public uh, with the social media campaign is, you know, you could never ask for anything more at your fingertips to send messages out to the hunters. Um, it's neat. It's neat to see. I mean, I know there's a lot of pros and cons of going online and buying your license online, and the trend is definitely going that way with the next generation. But with that comes challenges, but also comes opportunity. And the opportunity that this department has taken advantage of the last couple of years has, has obviously played out well. Questions from board members for the team. Marcy. Uh, first, I just wanna to add to that comment as well. Uh, Kimberly and Sarah, that's awesome. Uh, Sarah, it does make me nervous when uh, the, the team starts responding on Facebook because you never know where the comments are gonna go, but they do a great job and the people definitely appreciate it. Um, Casey, could you uh, clarify for me, please, where the hunter safety um, pandemic and what's on site and what's virtual right now, please. Sure. Um, just doing a mic check. If everybody can hear me again. Okay. Casey Krieger, Chief Warden. Yeah. So right now we're with COVID being where it's at, we still offer that virtual piece and option for all the citizens. There are in-person hunter ed classes that are going on uh, where families can send, you know, or adults even want to participate uh, being in a classroom. But uh, we also still, to this day, right now, real time, provide the virtual option, and and we just put a team together that's going to be comprised of hunter ed instructors, a hunter ed coalition, and other uh, partner groups to look at uh, to Doc's point the use of technology and where we move forward um, with that program. So the kind of the state we're at now is we're holding tight until we can come out of this pandemic, and then we will be doing a hard look at what our next step is, uh, whether we go back to the way it used to be, or if we progress to something else. That'll be something that that team will be working on and be presenting that on up to the secretary's office uh, for consideration. Okay, 
or maybe a hybrid of at least the, the gun handling uh, gets some extra attention. Thank you. Any other questions? Terry. Thank you, and I'm not sure who gets this one, but all of them can if they want to. Do we have any program in place to follow up with uh, discontinued hunters? In other words, somebody that had a license two years ago and, and uh, didn't take one out this year to try to invite them back into the, into the game, if you will? Terry, I'll take that. Yes, we do. That's called our lapsed hunter uh, campaign. So there are mechanisms behind the scenes through wildlife, as well as the Office of Communication that reaches out to those lapsed hunter roles, if you will. So we're able to send messages. Hey, don't forget to sign up, buy your license. Don't forget the season is coming. So yes, there are mechanisms in place to reach that audience specifically. Do we measure then what those results are, Sarah? I don't have it at the fingertips. Uh, someone on staff might have it. I believe wildlife may have this, but we also do. I'll look into that for you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Anybody else? Sorry, this is Jeff Fritzel. Sorry. Um, I know the Human Dimension staff did some um, focus groups and some surveys on that. Um, I can check with Bob Holzman. Uh, they may have generated some results of what the uh, reactivation were through for some of those efforts. Thank you, Jeff. Bill Smith. Yeah, thanks, Doc. I, you know, your comment about technology is right on the mark. The, the convenience and the information available to me, to people is just tremendous. But I continue to get these little anecdotal nagging questions about one item of convenience in our deer season. It has to do with deer registrations. And I think a lot of it's just people not seeing tags flapping off the carcass of a deer to show they've been registered. So it raises questions. And uh, Casey, I'm wondering if, if you could comment on uh, trends in enforcement relative to deer registration complaints and cases. Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Bill, for the question. Yeah, it's uh, we hear that to this day out in the landscape anytime there's a change instituted or a law changed. Obviously, that's a change for our public and folks seeing things, as you allude to, it was a lot easier for people to feel comfortable that deer were registered or properly tagged or legally taken when they could see that visual piece on an animal. Uh, you know, it, it causes for a lot of speculation as to what the numbers truly are, obviously, but just, I guess, for context, what I did is I had my staff pull uh, from a citation standpoint, how many citations that we wrote during that nine day gun deer season as it relates to registration. And we, what was recorded was a total of 27 citations. Now, I, I, the reason why I bring that up for context is we wrote over 153 citations for illegal baiting and feeding. So it's, it's obviously, it, our folks out there doing that, um, yes, we're coming across it. I know our folks are extremely vigilant on, and good at pivoting and finding new ways, utilizing technology to ensure folks are being compliant with the law, but it's on our radar as are a lot of these things as our partners and wildlife uh, look to use that data, uh, you know, as far as citations, contacts, issues that we're seeing out there that can help them with their population models. So um, nothing dramatic, nothing jumps out that we were in the hundreds of not registered animals, but I, I say that with caution because um, as with history has taught us, we, we do have a lot of investigations that continue on throughout the year that stem back from the nine-day gun deer season, so kind of more to come there. Casey, has that number stayed fairly steady over the last few years, or is there a trend? It's, uh, you know, I'd have to go back and probably grab some data from like 2016, 2017, back when we were still kind of, well, it was probably further back than that, 2014, when we switched from the Alice system over, and um, you know, it's, it's nothing has jumped out. Uh, when I asked our deputy chiefs for perspective on that, they said there's no new outstanding trends that they're seeing with enforcement. But uh, it, we, our officers are, do, are hearing those and getting those complaints out there that folks aren't registering those deer and we follow up on those. It just, again, highlights that, that very important piece to our success is that welding with our public um, to assist us in those areas. Thank you. I hope that answers some of those nagging anecdotal complaints and concerns and puts into perspective that part of enforcement with some of the other ones that are keeping you much busier. Thanks. Darren? 
Well, to underscore what everyone has said and to clap about it, it's just outstanding, especially the area of communication. Uh, Wisconsin is on the map and is where in, in many states. Um, Sarah, you mentioned that there were targeted areas. Do you have any feedback or any information on those? You were reaching out to particular groups. Some of that detail we won't have just yet because some of that information is gonna have to still be analyzed, but we wanted to make a concerted effort to go after women, people of color and millennials. So we did that by you know, hitting up certain areas, right? Highly big on social, where those billboards went, things of that nature. So in terms of, can I definitively say that a billboard in Madison directly correlated to four black people purchasing a license? No, I cannot. But I do know that we are out front and in front of people who we were never before. That's really the big goal there is to just make sure that our name, our brand, our message is, is in more places than it was previously. Thank you. You bet. Okay, excellent report. Um, Laura's look forward to it. Uh, Your hand is up. Just, no rooms. just a quick comment. I'd just like to just uh, reinforce everything that's already been said, uh, but just point out in all of this discussion, what this says to me is that deer hunting in Wisconsin is, is king. Uh, and, and I think that we have to keep that in mind as we go forward in our management plan. Uh, and, and, and this affects so many people, so many landowners. Uh, I, I think this, uh, the, the deer uh, herd has, has the support of private landowners and farmers more than any other, uh, any other type of wildlife in the state. Uh, I had a grandson that took his, harvested his first two deer with a, with a bow this year. I had another grandson harvested his first deer this year in, in the holiday hunt. So I, th this is impacting a lot of people. Okay, Bill. Thanks, let's move on to Secretary Matters. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And follow up with what staff has said, of course, these are our true heroes behind the scenes. Uh, they, uh, you never hear from them, but the, you know they're hard at work. And outdoor recreation in the state of Wisconsin is a $17.5 billion industry that includes deer hunting, our fishing license. We're number three in the nation for <laughs> fishing license. And it's important for us to recognize that, you know, uh, the deer hunting community certainly is a time-honored tradition. And uh, Marcy had uh, mentioned this idea of safety with gun handling. You know, what, what Casey and those folks have provided me is that these are adults that we find that are getting injured and hurt more often. I think there's a 38-year-old person this past year, a 60-year-old person, a 55-year-old person. And it makes us wonder if uh, safe gun handling practices as you get older, do folks need a refresher that we can send something in the mail just to remind them, or do they need to come back and see us again? And as we get older, we know that our, our sight and our energy around deer hunting begins, begins to wane. And so we're, we're, we're thinking of in a lot of different ways as to continue to lower the rate of incidents that happen out when we're deer hunting and Casey and his team and all the folks you heard from today are make it exciting for me to see what they come up with. And Mr. Chair, with the retirement resolutions, I have five that come before the board. Uh, our uh, public employee number one, so to speak, Kent Van Horn, wildlife section, 23 years. Uh, Kelly Kearns, natural heritage and conservation with 38 years. Gregory Mitchell from forestry for 22 years. Dean Starks, technical services, 32 years. Sherry Weiss, Waste and management, uh, waste and materials management for 33 years. I offer those five individuals up for a happy retirement. A motion. So Terry. Second. Sharon. Um, I, I, we don't have to put this part of the motion, but I, I would like to quickly um, let's vote and I'll tell you what I got to say. All in favor say aye. 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 I oppose, Mr. Secretary, second, Devolge, second. Uh, Brett Alderman, our, our uh, webcast director is retiring and I, I was supposed to mention in the beginning it's my, my, my bad. Um, Brett obviously has been, has gone from Pony Express to this department to 
making us one of the uh, best IT departments in the state when it comes to transparency in government. And uh, his leadership will be missed, but it will be going on for generations because he makes this stuff happen. And I've never seen such a ability of the public to weigh in and watch what happens with this board compared to other agencies in the state. So Brett, uh, please accept our, our condolences, not condolences, but congratulations on your retirement. And um, uh, the secretary is back to you. Thank you. And that's a great point. And uh, you shouldn't see what he does when he's not working at the Department of Natural Resources. He's probably one of the most creative individuals that I've talked to about outdoor recreation as well. Okay. And so um, the acts are of the department are in your binder. If there's no questions, we'll move on. And as usual, I will turn uh, the secretary's matters, uh, yield some of my time to Sandy and for her report. Uh, Sandy, you, you on? I am here. Thank okay. you, Secretary Cole. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman and NRB members, good afternoon. My name is Sandra D. Noss, and I was appointed to the board in May 2021, and I'm currently awaiting a Senate confirmation right. hearing. And thank you for allowing me some time to share some highlights from Northern Wisconsin. I mentioned a few meetings ago that grass, the grassroots effort called Lake Superior Not For Sale to stop the proposed sale of artesian water from Northern Bayfield County. Um, Bayfield County recently denied that permit for the proposal and the courts are now reviewing that action. Northland College's Center for Freshwater Innovation recently released a report with four recommendations the county should take to protect artesian systems. At a meeting I attended last September uh, at the Big Top Chautauqua in Bayfield, Todd Ames, and state geologist Ken Bradbury discussed uh, efforts to protect water resources in the basin. And they gave, also gave a primer on artesian water <coughs> and identified threats to declining, these declining resources. Statewide, I believe there's around 11,000 um, artesian uh, uh, wells, basically. Um, but there's been um, about 1,000 that have, have dried up um, in recent years. This court decision may have statewide implications and I encourage folks to follow the story. In uh, early 2021, DNR issued a fish consumption advisory for rainbow smelts in Lake Superior. The issue was PFAS and DNR found an average, uh, on average that PFAS was found in the smelt at a rate of seven times that of other, other fish species. PFAS is a concern for all of us and I, around the state, and I encourage this board to continue to take steps to help all Wisconsinites have clean, safe water and safe wild food sources. Uh, one uh, big thing that's happening, at least in my neck of the woods, um, there's a public hearing happening that uh, for the DNR environmental review of Enbridge's line five reroute on February 2nd at four o'clock via Zoom. This project affects about 185 waterways and temporarily, temporarily impacts wetland and Ashland in Ashland and Iron Counties. The line currently goes through the Bad River Reservation. I encourage you to check out this project and make plans to listen in on February 2nd. The reroute goes south around um, the Bad River Reservation, goes through Mellon and then up um, back toward, into Iron County um, toward a, a connection point. So I encourage you to, to check that out. It's a, um, a pretty controversial issue up here and something to be, um, to be watching. Um, on, a, on a side note, please continue to work um, and, and take efforts to keep CWD from spreading Bakefield County, Ashland, Iron, Douglas County, um, our counties that don't have CWD or have not seen them yet. Um, and we wanna keep it that way. And uh, last fall, a woman's learn to hunt weekend, I'm sorry, learn to trap weekend was held in Northern Wisconsin and added many new female trappers, which I was really happy to see. On a personal note, I was lucky to draw a bobcat tag for second season this, this year. I am working on trapping through January 31st. I actually pulled my traps on Sunday because in preparation for going to Madison. So I have to reset um, on Friday so I can have a couple more days to, to see if I can catch one. I haven't had any luck yet, but uh, seeing tracks keeps me going. And um, I get to learn something new almost daily. Trapping is a great way to get outdoors in all types of weather. And I appreciate the opportunity, even if I don't harvest one. Thank you again, Secretary Cole, for yielding some of your time today. I appreciate it. 
All right, thank you, Sandra. The secretary, is that it? Chris, is that it, Mr. Secretary? I'm sorry, say that again, Doc. I said, is that it? The report complete? Uh, that is it, and I think you are now in board member matters. Okay, thank you. Um, the first item I want to talk about real quickly is, is, a, is, a, is a referral, but I want to preempt it with a um, discussion here, not discussion, at least a statement. Um, this is regarding Deg Pipe Lake, and more importantly, the Powell Marsh up there. Many of us have attended meetings. This has been ongoing on for many, many years um, between the state and the residents of Mantridge Waters. It's unfortunate that this uh, administration of clean water could not get this over the finish line for various reasons. But believe me, this is an impaired waterway. Uh, the DNR and the Mantridge Waters the citizens and have gone back and forth for quite a long time, for even, even before this current administration. This is a prob project, a problem that our government caused. And I, as I research this more and I, and I think about it more and more, the actual source of this problem is not Dead Pike Lake, it's the Paul Marsh. And I think it's important that the citizens and this board more importantly, at this time, understand exactly what transpired up there and what some solutions are to fix this unfair waterway. So therefore, my referral to the administration is to be brought back by May, the following. One, the history of the Powell Marsh to include what our government did to this marsh to affect the downstream impairment of different waterways. We were up there, we heard it firsthand, but I think the board members should be understanding exactly what occurred up there. Number two, I think that it's important that the board understand the long history between the town of Manitrish Waters repairing owners and the DNR going back many administrations regarding this issue. It's long standing. And I think it's a, that history is important part of a solution. But more importantly, my third referral to the depart to the administration is to is to have a preliminary discussion with the engineering firm who studied and provided a path forward to clean up Dead Pipe Lake as to what is really needed to fix the source of the problem and to bring it back to the board. It may sound complicated, but it's not. All these things can be taken care of in an hour if somebody sat down for the board to review at the May meeting. Let's be really clear, everybody. This is an impaired waterway, one that can be fixed. Unlike some of our repair waterways, it can't be fixed. It doesn't have big economic impact from farmers or point source. This is something that this government did. None of us here, but this government did. And now legislators are taking notice. It's got federal interest. It's not going away. We can say, we can say well, we, we provide a fix, but you know, the bottom line is it's not being fixed, whatever reason but it's not going away, nor should it. The board and the public need to know what really happened up there. And more importantly, we need to get it fixed. So that's my referral to board matters. It's up to the new leadership if they want to, or it's up to the secretary if he wants to abide by my request. But I think those three things would be a good starting point for this board to ponder in the May meeting. Mr. Chair? Yes. Sure, we can put something together for you. Thank you. And uh, matter of fact, we can, I wanted uh, Stephen and to speak to it today. And uh, as a point of order as well, regarding um, what people believe happened and didn't happen. I wasn't born in, 19, in the 1950s, but people blame the state of Wisconsin for a lot of things. And we have had serious negotiations. If you remember, I was on the board when we took that first tour. Right. I understand uniquely as to the circumstances. And, you know, the folks in Manitowish Waters are trustworthy, honest, and brave. It's just, we just continue to not agree. But Stephen's going to tell you what we have done in the past. Stephen? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. And a good afternoon, members of the Natural Resources Board. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources has been working with the Town of Manitowish Waters on issues and concerns with Dead Pike Lake for more than seven years, uh, including the Powell Marsh Master Plan, which was approved by 
the Natural Resources Board in 2016, as well as a jointly drafted Dead Pike Lake Management Plan, which uh, was crafted between the department and the town of Manitowish Waters in 2018. In that plan, it was found that between 86 and 92% of the iron and 66% of the phosphorus in Dead Pike Lake entered via the groundwater and that the source of the iron and the phosphorus is naturally occurring. Now, while some landowners contend that the water quality issues exist and are diminished because of the development of Powell Marsh in the 1950s, core samples from the early 1900s, uh, well before the development of Powell Marsh show that the phosphorus levels have been consistent over the last 100 years. Uh, there are over 1,500 bodies of water in Wisconsin that are on the federal impaired list. 143 of those bodies are listed and identified as high priority. 141 of those bodies are identified as medium priority. Dead Pike Lake is one of the 1,242 bodies of water which are listed as low priority. Nevertheless, the DNR has been working in collaboration uh, with the township or with the town of Manitowish Waters for the past several years to move this project forward. I can speak from personal experience. Uh, when I came to the department almost three years ago, being appointed as the director of management and budget, one of my first assignments was to assist in finding additional funding to get this project over the finish line. I was given that assignment by former Deputy Secretary Beth Beer, and it was one of the first projects that I worked on worked on with James Yock, who was the South or the Northern uh, Secretary's Director for the DNR. The DNR has fulfilled 100% of its regulatory commitment, including the approval of all necessary, necessary permits and plans. Over a quarter of a million dollars has already been secured for this project. All of it was secured with the understanding that the town of Manitowish Waters would be the owner of the dam. This does not include an earmark of $125,000 in the 2021 2023 biennial budget, which was signed into law by Governor Evers. All permit applications were submitted by and approved with the town of Manitowish Waters, taking ownership responsibilities. Again, all funding, including state and federal grant funding and grant eligibility, is contingent upon municipal ownership of the dam. In addition, dam ownership by the town of Manitowish Waters provides access to the state's municipal dam grant program, which provides a 50% cost share up to a million dollars and a 25% cost share for the next $2 million. The DNR does not have access to those resources. Now, why can't the DNR own the dam? The DNR has never assumed ownership of a dam for a project such as this. The threshold for public safety has not been met. There are also private property and riparian considerations. There are 23 private property inholdings on that lake. Not all private property owners on the lake agree with how the lake management levels should be managed and are assisted in managing the levels to prevent adverse shoreline impacts. After consulting with staff, I learned that the DNR has not taken ownership of a dam in the past 15 years and likely much longer given that our current staff has a seniority of 15 years. Current staff is also not aware of the DNR ever taking ownership for projects such as this. Lastly, more than a quarter of a million dollars has already been expended on the Dead Pike Lake project through the town of Manitowish Waters. Additional federal resources are earmarked for continued execution of the lake management plan through the town of Manitowish Waters. This does not include the $125,000 earmark, which, the most, which was contained in the most recent biennial budget, which will lapse at the end of the biennium if uh, not used. This also does not contemplate the significant monies already expended uh, for permitting um, for the outlet structure, which cannot be recovered. The DNR has and stands ready to continue to work with the town of Manitowish Waters to complete this project. Thank you for your time. James Yock is also available to answer any of your questions as he has been intimately involved with this project since its inception. 
Well, my, my response back to you, Steve, is I, I just want to make sure it's really crystal clear on this testimony today. I'm not debating where the department's been and how the department's worked with Manchester Waters to get where we are today. The fact is it's not done. Number two, are you saying that the Paul Marsh in the 50s that was excavated to its current status is not contributing to that downward boom? What I'm saying is that the core samples that were taken from the from that area in the 1900s showed that the levels of phosphorus remain consistent over time. What I'm also saying is that the levels of phosphorus and iron are coming from the groundwater. Not from the marsh. According to the research that has been done and according to the lake management plan, I'd ask Mr. Yak uh, if he has further information but my understanding is those things have been, um, you know, indeed found to be true. And I'm just stating you, Stephen, that moving forward, the statements made today on this testimony are going to be extremely important moving forward. Mr. Yak, want to join the conversation? I'm more than welcome. It. James, we've talked many times before. You have something you want to add to this scenario? I understand how we got where we are with the ownership of the dam. I understand that. I understand, sure. that that was, that, I understand that that was an engineered fix for that particular lake, they believe, as had been done before. But this is the first I've heard of the department taking a stand that the Paul Marsh is really nothing to do with what's going on at that pipe pipe. Yeah, Chair Prey, uh, Secretary Cole, uh, members of the Natural Resources Board, James Jack, Secretary's Director for the North, has stated I've had a long history with this work group. And so to directly answer your question, in 2018, the completed lake management plan, which was done in concert with the three parties in section 1.2, it's using um, the Stella model, which was which was devised by Applied Ecological Services, states that the 86% of the groundwater or iron, it comes from the groundwater, as well as 66% from the phosphorus. And it verbatim says that the groundwater portion of the iron load is naturally occurring and is a naturally occurring condition. That's the, the most recent and relevant science that we have to base our, our understanding off of. Additionally, it is it has shown that 8 to 14 percent would come directly from the marsh. Um, there was a comparison that was done in the lake management plan that shows the outputs from the surface water from the marsh is indeed about twice as high as the non-ditch portion of the Deerfoot marsh that's nearby. So the surface water, which constitutes eight to 14% is directly impacted by the, by the uh, management actions that have been taken place on Paul Marsh. Clarifies it. Any other members who have any questions regarding my referral, Marcy? Yeah, and, and this may be a question for Cheryl. Um, I, reading all the comments and, and the legislative letters, what is the role of the board in an issue like this? Do we have do we have any standing authority on that? Uh, Cheryl Heilman, um, I would say that uh, Secretary Cole has responded um, that the department is going to be providing additional information in response to the board's request, and so that would be the prerogative of the secretary, is what I would say about that topic. And so what she's what she what what Cheryl is saying is. If Doc wants us to uh, get back into negotiations where my direction to Beth is find the money. She found a quarter of a million dollars. We came up with the engineering. I was in the same room with ecological service as what you folks were and saw the same report. So I can't continue to debate the facts of the matter. We looked for the solution. And the solution is we don't own the dam. We got the money to put the dam in and the structure in. And that was agreed to because the permits said the same thing. But if you want me to go back and have that conversation with them again and see if they've had a change of heart, I'm more than willing. And I would send uh, Sarah and Stephen and James as emissaries of me because I want to get it solved. But, you know, it's, 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 it's difficult to agree on the facts that we have and what people believe who have spent their lifehood up there as well and have a, a set of principles as to what they believe happened. We don't take ownerships of dams. 
specifically on property we don't own. And that puts the citizens of the state of Wisconsin in the long-term repair and maintenance of this property. That's a big deal, Doc. Well, I guess, Preston, and then we differ how we're the source of the cause. I guess somebody, somebody have to figure it out. Some I science. got the solution. I have the solution. We've had the solution. Now, again, as emissaries for you, Doc, you, I am attempting to go back to Manitowish and that community and begin to have a poignant, meaningful discussion about where they are and if they've moved the needle to what we've recommended to as a solution. I can promise you that. And it doesn't have to wait till May. It won't have to wait till May. Anything that would move the ball forward, Preston, would be greatly appreciated. Okay. Consider it done. We'll begin those conversations. I look forward to those conversations with the good people of uh, Manitou Wishwaters. All right. Let's go to any other questions for board members. If not, we're going to go to board matters. Bill Bruins, do you have anything? Well, uh, I, I just want to add my two cents worth to this discussion on, on Paul Marsh and Dead Pike Lake. Uh, I, too, was up there along with you, uh, uh, Secretary Cole, and, and, and some of the members of the board. Um, I, I, don't think, I don't think in this, d- just the discussion we just had, that, that we've clarified uh, for sure, whether the actions that the department took in modifying Paul Marsh uh, is is totally innocent of of any of the changes that have taken place in Dead Pike Lake. So I I strongly encourage uh, the department's uh, uh, continued consideration in the challenges that they face there. Anything under any else you have referral, Bill? Oh. Terry? Thank you. Thank you, Press, for following up. Uh, yeah, I got my ear bent pretty good by a couple different folks uh, this week about deer hunting. Can you imagine that? About deer hunting, no less. <laughs> and some of it was uh, touched on by uh, Casey, but uh, issues are. Uh, registration is false because there's a bunch of guys that aren't registering their deers because they don't have to because they're out in the woods and uh, they don't want to do it electronically. Two is that has greatly impeded our progress on CWD. If we had to register deer at registration stations, it makes it a much, much easier for people to participate in the CWD program. Um, And three is and every, this is one of everybody's favorites. There's too many seasons, and it's too slanted toward archery and bull. There you got it. And those three would be more legislative concerns, Terry, than board concerns, correct? Well, except we could foster some of that across the aisle for us, across the street. So what, do you, what exactly are you asking for, for Preston to... To well, tell us, but tell us, give me give me something pointed so it stays in the in the referral process if there is such a referral. But I know a lot of that is legislative. Yes. Reporting to deer. Um, yep. I think yep. license structure we got some flexibility on. We've been talking about simplifying the license structure for years, but the legislators have all these different licenses for all these different reasons. Well, the so, other thing that we do, though, correct uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, is is number of seasons that we incorporate. Kaz, what what are that what are that is in our arsenal or quiver? I would well, <laughs> I would yield to uh, you know the department to come up with issues that I just raised to see if you know is there anything we can do about it? Okay, then let's leave it that way. Yeah, the secretary you understand. We're, have, we're, we'll still be in this meeting for the next five hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All um, right. I, I, this isn't the first time uh, Terry has raised these issues, so. Uh, I will have staff meet with Terry individually if, with law enforcement, wildlife, uh, customer service, and legal to see what's in our quiver, what's not, what's legislative. And, and, and Terry, in terms of season structures going forward, please be prepared to tell us what you're thinking uh, so we don't have to try to figure it out. 
So just when you get with our team, just let them know what you're thinking. Thank you. You bet. All right. Kaz, I'm sorry. Sharon, getting my order straight in my head. From we're not sitting. Sharon, do you have anything on board matters? Um, come back to me, please. Come back to you. Okay. Uh, Kaz. Um, I do have one, Mr. Chair. Um, so <clears throat> regarding the wolf, the state wolf lawsuit, um, we as a board have heard very little what's going on. Um, and I'm somewhat disappointed that me and many of the constituents of our constituents that we didn't appeal that decision. And I'd like to request that we have a meeting um, at the next session to address the legal issues and where the board stands on pressing forward with a strong defense on that lawsuit. So you're asking for a post session next month? Correct. Okay, so noted. It's a request you can make. Um, Marcy. Thank you. Yes, uh, I would like to request that the um, department and staff consider, well, and obviously the agenda setting. For February, we're going to have very important issues um, with a lot of public comment. It may be an opportunity to try an evening uh, session for uh, public input. It's been made clear that not everybody can, can be online on a Wednesday morning. So I think an evening session would allow us to hear from folks that are directly affected. Um, I, I recognize that it's an impact to staff and, and technology, but as you said, uh, they're very talented and I, I don't know uh, any state employees that work a strict eight to 4.30 schedule. So I would at least like to bring that up as an opportunity. Okay, that'll be discussed when they set the agenda. Um, so noted. Bill Smith, anything? Uh, thanks, Doc. I, uh, I covered my concerns in the agenda items and they happen to coincide with some of the feedback I've heard. So I'll pass. Thank you. Darren, back to you. Thank Any you. More matters. And, and not at this time. Thank you. Not this time. Okay, thank you. Board matters closed. We're moving to the election of officers. We're going to do the election of officers so the public's very clear, the same way we've done this for the last 20, 30 years. In that we're virtual, there's going to be a pause if there is a contested uh, contested opening where they, they'll be sent to survey because statute allows a secret ballot. And that's the way we worked around it with Sharon. I mean, uh, with Cheryl. So with that being said, I will open up the nominations for secretary. Um, nominate Bill Smith. Bill Smith nominated, does not need a second. Bill Smith, do you accept the nomination? You're muted, Bill. President Chair, while Bill is unmuting, I just want to say that I understand that this is a process that has gone on for a while. But could you provide the process for nominations and elections of officers? Sure, Ken. We open up the nomination for secretary first. People nominate does not need a second. I will then go to the person nominated and I will ask that person if they accept the nomination, they can give a little speech if they like to or a brief comment. I will then go to any other nominations. If somebody else nominates somebody, I will then ask that person, do they wanna be part of the nomination? And if they say yes, then that person will be put on a ballot. And then I'll ask for any more. And if that's all we have, then we close nominations. And then I will go to a ballot. And Cheryl Hellman and Kari will put together a monkey survey ballot of the two names or three names or four names or five names, or whatever it is to be sent out to us. We will take a five minute recess. And then Cheryl, along with Kari as a witness, will then tally the votes and they will uh, telephone me. I believe we're going to do that, Cheryl, and announce the. Uh, results and it'll come back on. I'll say the results for the this office is blank, and we move and then we will move on to the next office and open up nominations and repeat the process. Did Thank I explain you. it? Yes. Okay, Bill Smith, to you. You've been nominated for secretary, Bill. Do you accept nomination or? I have a question on that. <clears throat> sure. I have an interest in um, being a candidate for the chair position later on the agenda. 
Mm -hmm. If I accept this nomination and I'm elected secretary, does that preclude me from being considered for the chair? I believe so, Bill, because then we'd have to revote the secretary. I'd, so in I'd the past, in, I've looked in written guidance, uh, and I can't find anything in writing that that uh, determines that. I have great respect for the custom of the board, and obviously, in the role of chair, you're in a position to make decisions on that as well. And I just ask if you'd be willing to reconsider that order. Uh, the answer to that at the present time is no. I'm doing the order the same way we've done it in the past, so I can't be accused of manipulating any type of order for the sake of one or the other. So the answer is no. The question I petition. Is the, I would petition the chair. Go ahead. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that premise. What uh, do you want to do then, Terry? When the when if he runs for a different office, do we come back and revote the secretary then? Absolutely. The rest of the board want to do that. Yes. Consensus? Yes. Okay. You set the nomination, Bill. Let me be clear, I understand this. Uh, we're gonna keep the original order, uh, secretary, vice chair, and chair. And if I'm elected to secretary, I'm still uh, a viable candidate for subsequent positions on the board. That's the will of the board at the present time for elections, and we can do it the way we want to uh, by, by a consensus. So yes, you'd have to resign it. We'd have to revote the secretary slot. I'm not trying to be disruptive. I just, my experience in other boards has been the order has been reversed. And that was what I was accustomed to. And I was wondering if we had flexibility to do it that way. I respect your decision. And uh, Terry, I'm honored by your uh, nomination to be secretary. And under the stated circumstances, I accept that. Bill Smith, is any other nominations for secretary? Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Hearing none, nominations are closed. I'll take a voice vote. Bill Smith, secretary, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Bill, you're uh, elected secretary. We'll keep that in queue. Vice chair nominations. I'd like to move Bill Bruins, please. Move Bill Bruins. Bill, do you accept the nomination? I will. You will. Any, uh, Bill Smith. I would like to make a nomination as well and, and frame that around a couple of brief remarks. Um, I celebrate that each of us brings very different experiences and, and perspectives to this board, none better or worse, just different. And I think those differences are our strength. They enable broader public interaction, robust discussion, and informed decisions. Very important ingredients to fulfilling the statutory role of the Natural Resources Board. This selection process is an opportunity to recognize our differences in a positive way and present the board with leadership choices in an open and transparent election, the foundation of a healthy democracy. In that spirit, uh, I nominate Marcy West uh, for the position of vice chair. Marcy, you accept the nomination? Yes, sir. Do you have anything you want to say? I, I, uh, I recognize the importance of these offices. Uh, I've learned a great deal in the past two years, and I would like to make sure that we have that, that broad representation. So yes, I okay. accept. Any more nominations for vice chair? Hearing none, nominations are closed. Uh, Cheryl and Kari will put together an email for us. We'll take a five minute recess and we'll come back. If the email did not come through, you don't have a chance to vote, we will um, take another five minute recess. But in the meantime, uh, Cheryl, you on? Is that plenty, you ready to go? Uh, I am and um, if Kari is on and, and she's ready to go, uh, that sounds like the right process to me. You will receive an email that, that you open up and that that you that that will allow you to vote. And just to clarify, your your email will will have all of the options uh, for board members who might be eligible for the vice chair position. And you just vote again, keeping in mind who's been nominated. Uh, vote for the uh, candidate of your choice. 
I would remind board members that we are suspended for five minutes, but there should be no private communication between board members regarding this election. We will reconvene in five minutes. Uh, Doc, could I ask yes. just for clarification? I'm gonna have to click out of this because of my technology here. Uh, will I be able to rejoin the, the normal way, the same way I did this morning? Bill, in the upper corner, you should be able to. But in the upper corner, if you put your mouse up there, should be a minus sign. Upper upper right corner, excuse me. Uh, should be a minus. Are you on an iPad or are you on a laptop? I, I, I'm on a, I'm on a uh, desktop. Well, you should have a minus there, a minus and a box and an X. If you hit the minus, that's going to minimize the Zoom meeting, and then you can get to your email, and then you can come back in. But if um, you do, if you do... By hitting the same minus sign? Just hit the minus sign, you're going to be minimized in the bottom tray, and you can go to your email, and then go to the bottom tray and click on it, it should come back up. But if you could do disconnected, then re just redial back in, like you did, or reconnect back in. Okay? All right. We'll take a five minute recess.
Um, this is Cheryl. I just want to uh, make sure that everyone who wants to vote has had an opportunity to vote. And so if, if anyone is having technical difficulties, um, please feel free to give me a call. Cheryl, can I talk to you directly? I think it would be best, Bill, if you gave me a call. This is, yeah, okay. I'll do that, thank you. Okay, everybody back in session or back from the pause. Cheryl is calling me. The ballots have been read and the vice chair would be Bill Bruins at a vote of four to three. Congratulations, so we, Bill. Thank you, We move on to chair. Is there a nomination for chair? I, Doc, I nominate Greg Kazminski uh, for chair. Kaz, do you accept the nomination? Uh, thank you, and, and I do accept the nomination. Um, and I do want to thank the board for their unanimous votes the last three times I ran for vice chair. Um, and what I look forward to, if I do become chair, is uh, a little speech that we had from Christine Thomas when she was on the board. We had we were the newbies at the time, and she was confident that the board would gel um, like all boards do. We have had a little bit of an issue because COVID came up right in the middle. So this board hasn't really got to know each other very well except on YouTube. So I'm looking forward to getting this board to gel um, like we have in the past. So thank you for the nomination. 
Right, you need the nominations for chair? Yes, I'd like to nominate Bill Smith, please. All right, Bill Smith, you accept the nomination. I do. <clears throat> I'd like to make a couple of brief comments, Doc. Sure. You bet. Just to emphasize uh, three points that I think are, are vital to our success as a board and important to me personally, uh, so you know what you're getting. First one is the statutory role of the board. Uh, I think it's paramount that we fulfill that role of supervision and oversight of the department in regulatory, advisory, and policymaking matters. The second one is our shared mission with the department, the Conservation Congress in particular, Sporting Heritage Council, and our wide range of conservation partners. That mission emphasizes rich and abundant natural resources, a clean and healthy environment, and access for all. And I would work hard to emphasize a positive, collaborative relationship with those partners to accomplish that mission. The last point, and an important one, is the conduct of business uh, in an open and transparent manner, welcoming public input from all viewpoints in accordance with Robert's rules to ensure that we have orderly and efficient conduct of our business, equal member rights of the board, and uh, conducting my duties as chair in an impartial manner. Thank you very much for your consideration. All right, Bill, thank you. Any more nominations for chair? If not, I move nominations closed. Once again, uh, survey will come out. We will reconvene in five minutes. And I will announce the new chairman, my last official duty as chairman of this National Research Board. So it will take five minutes. Thank you. Um, this is Cheryl again. I just want to make sure that everyone 
who wishes to vote has had the opportunity to do so. Um, if you're having any technical difficulties, uh, don't hesitate to give me a call or, or let me know. Okay, let's reconvene. Is everybody here? What are we missing here? Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe we're waiting for Mr. Hilgenberg. Okay, thank you. I think I'm here. Am I not here? <laughs> There's Terry. Sorry, Terry. The video's off. Oh, I got to start the start the video thing. I got it now. That's all right. Uh, the votes have been tabulated, and our chairman is Greg Kazmierski, and a vote of four to three. So with that said, Kaz, I virtually hand the gavel over to you as my last order of business chairman. Last year's have been, shall I say, interesting. Um, your plate is gonna be full, like every incoming chair has. The issues are no less as important as they were three, four, five, ten 10 years ago with this board. And with that, I would ask for a motion for adjournment. Please. Huh? Terry. Terry. Yeah, I move to adjourn. Okay, is there a second? Second. I need a second for adjournment. Second. A second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Means adjourn. See everybody in February. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody. Stay warm. Bye. And well. Yep. And well. <laughs>